Thank you, Messi. Wayne Crooks et al. versus John Newton. Donald J. Jordan QC and Robert A. Casting for the appellants. Daniel W. Burnett and Harvey S. Delaney for the respondent. Wendy Matheson, Andrew Bernstein and Molly Reynolds for the intervener. Canadian Liberties Association, Roy W. Millen, for the intervener, British Columbia Liberties Association, Robert S. Anderson, QC, and Ludmilla B. Herbst, for the intervener, Canadian Newspaper Association, et al. And Wendy Wagner, for the intervener, Samuelson Glushko, Canadian Internet Policy and Public Interest Clinic, William C. McDowell, Margaret F. Ethier and Naomi D. Loweth for the Intervenor Net Coalition. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Chief Justice. Justices. Uh, this morning, uh, the case that you're about to hear is about finding the correct balance between freedom of expression and the protection of reputation in the context of the use of hyperlinks on the internet. I'm not going to uh, uh, spend any time describing what a hyperlink is. It's uh, more than adequately described in the materials, but I do want to note one uh, uh, element of nomenclature that may be uh, an issue. I have used in my materials the word embedded uh, to describe a hyperlink which is part of the text of the original site. And uh, some of the uh, other participants have used it differently um, in a way that I, I would have described as an automatic embedded hyperlink, which, when you click on a site, brings the material directly to you. So I just wanted to draw that to your attention. This case actually uh, presents some fairly stark alternatives for the court. Um, interestingly enough, uh, all of the participants agree that the use of a hyperlink is expressive activity. It's intended to convey meaning. But then, after that uh, expression of unanimity, you're presented with some fairly stark positions, the, the, the polar extremes being uh, that hyperlinks should not uh, be subject or, or uh, limited by the law of defamation because of the cost to freedom of expression is too great a price to pay for the marginal benefit for the protection of reputation which would be gained. Two, uh, the other polar extreme being that the words used in a hyperlink ought not to be treated any differently than any other words in any other media. They must be used responsibly with a, an eye to the harm to someone individual's reputation that they potentially could cause from their use. And then there are points uh, in between those two polar extremes with some taking the position that they ought only to be uh, subject to limitation if they are an express endorsement and, and various other uh, configurations are used. I'm not going to spend uh, a good deal of time on the facts, but I think just to uh, uh, focus uh, myself. Uh, but the, on, I will I'm sorry, on the law, before you go, for the general principles that you just uh, say, well, the issues that are at stake, do you agree that in the context of defamation law, uh, you not only need to communicate to the public or to a person, but there needs to be some kind of evidence that at least one person has read or uh, received the communication. Um, I think that the, uh, uh, that question is a contextual question, and I think uh, looking at this court's case in Gaskin and, and, and the uh, uh, Dow Jones case from the Australian court, I, I believe that uh, the appropriate way to address that question is to look to see whether or not, to use the language of the Australian court, it's been made available for someone's comprehension. And uh, I'm not sure. So you don't accept that in the context of defamation, you need to have someone at the other end who has read or heard, was read 
if we're need, talking about something in writing. Yes, of, I, of course I do at the end of the day, but I believe that that can c come about by an evidentiary presumption or by inference from the facts. Do you, you do agree that it's part of defamation law, that you have either through a presumption or through actual evidence? Oh, that it, I, I agree that uh, it is a bilateral concept, but the one end, uh, 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 the putting it on paper being one side and the communication of it being another, and, and then I believe that uh, the law of defamation permits reliance upon presumptions and inferences with regard to that. Or someone's consideration is not bilateral, um, it's unilateral. Well, respectfully, I'm, I'm not sure that it is, my lord. I, I think that uh, uh, if I'm an author and I write it down and I make it available for comprehension, then in certain contexts, uh, um, it can be presumed that someone has read it and comprehended it. Well, what we're talking about is there's a presumption for newspapers, et cetera, et cetera. We all know about that, which helps you establish that second element of actually having read or listened to the material. And I guess the question for us is, is there such a presumption here? If not, uh, what evidence is required to permit the inference that someone has actually accessed it? Well, I believe the, uh, the presumption should be available here. Uh, respectfully, I'm, uh, I don't see any basis for treating uh, a piece of Internet journalism or blogging any differently than any other form of, of journalism, and, and particularly because of the unique uh, aspects of a hyperlink. And uh, I believe that a presumption should arise, but in any event, if a presumption doesn't arise, then the very existence of the hyperlink coupled with other elements in the factual record can lead to the conclusion, uh, an inference, that that bilateral test has been satisfied. But, it, but in other circumstances, the presumption is statutory, is it not, under the Libel and Slander Act? Um, for, You're for, asking here for a common law presumption. I'm it? asking here for a common law well, presumption. Why, but if the statutes in these other, if it was deemed necessary in these other circumstances to create a, a deemed presumption and statute, wouldn't you might might you not infer that the common law doesn't cover without a statutory presumption? Well, I believe that the common law uh, does contain within its circumstances outside of matters regulated by statute where uh, presumptions have arisen, and and uh, I believe that that the categories of circumstances where that can occur are not closed. On on that point, uh, just to clarify, because in your material it's perhaps just me, but I. Uh, you seem to conflate in some places a presumption and an inference uh, of fact. Um, it, it, should we not look at it differently? Like there's one question. Should there be a common law presumption, much as we have a statutory presumption for newspapers? Or there's the, the question, can uh, uh, the publication and the, the proof of that someone received the communication I would have thought, can always be inferred from some facts that are proven, but that's a different notion, there, isn't there, it? There's no question that presumptions and inferences are different things. Uh, a presumption presumes an, <laughs> an inference you derive <laughs> from, from elements of the thought. record. So are you, are you just uh, saying that when certain, on those facts, you'll get to this record eventually, that on, on certain facts, it's one thing that perhaps uh, a trial judge can draw an inference that someone has received a communication but to me, it's quite another to say that at law, if ABC is proven, it's a presumption of law that there is a, a person has received. As, well, well, maybe I could just, uh, uh, to focus on that question for a moment, uh, talk a little bit about the Gaskin case, because I think that presumptions are uh, largely contextual. And the Gaskin case of, of, of this court was a case where uh, a company in the business of providing credit reports was asked uh, uh, by one of its clients to provide a report, and it did provide the report. It, it wasn't a, uh, uh, something subject to a statutory uh, presumption. They did provide the, the report, and in that context, uh, this court held that they could presume, given that that was the nature of uh, uh, the request, that somebody 
uh, asked for it. There was no evidence on the record that the recipient read it. But the court said, well, we can presume that from that context. And I say that with regard to the utilization of hyperlinks, you can make, you can have the same type of presumption. A hyperlink, as you've seen in our materials, is something that has an intended effect. It's a considered choice. It's a judgment. And uh, in my respectful submission, a presumption can arise. But it goes back to your earlier requesting uh, a report is very different from somebody else simply making available. There's, there's no question it's a different context. Um, but I so respectfully, when, when one considers, when you review, you review the material, when one considers what a hyperlink is and what its purpose is to do, uh, uh, and of course we say it is a, a hyperlink is a, is a dynamic uh, thing, it is not just uh, uh, mute words, it's intended to have a particular purpose, just like somebody asking for a credit report. And uh, that, given there's an intention and a purpose to it, uh, it's, it's proper in, in some circumstances uh, uh, to presume that that was fulfilled. Why does there have to be such a stark dichotomy between it, a hyperlink always represents uh, publication and a hyperlink doesn't? Why can't it depend as as the court uh, talked about the footnote analogy, why can't it depend on the use to which the hyperlink appears to have been made in the context of the particular article? It, it, it certainly does, Milady, and, and, and uh, in the uh, condensed brief, you will see that having had the benefit of reading some of the materials um, with regard, uh, uh, just the condensed brief, paragraph eight, uh, we say that, of course, presumptions can always be rebutted. And if, a, if the evidence were to show that there was uh, uh, the author of the hyperlink was merely acting as an intermediary in the infrastructure of the Internet, uh, a mere conduit as opposed to a content provider, or whether it was created by an automatic, uh, automated tool, then the presumption, of course, would be rebutted. There need not always be the case that every hyperlink uh, is subject to the law of defamation. Uh, then I think I'll just uh, very briefly uh, go through the facts because the, the, the facts do provide the context for the utilization of, of the uh, uh, hyperlink. Um, Mr. Crooks, uh, the appellant, is a businessman in Vancouver and had an involvement with the Green Party. And uh, Mr. Newton, the respondent, uh, runs a website known as uh, P2P Net, and I understand P2P stands for People for People. Um, Mr. Newton uh, wrote an article on P2P Net uh, about internet libel and it was entitled Free Speech in Canada. And there were two uh, hyperlinks within that article. The first hyperlink was uh, the words open politics and it uh, took the person who clicked on it uh, to uh, a, a site in which a number of articles which the appellant says were defamatory of him uh, were uh, in existence, and they were written by somebody who had an involvement with uh, a, uh, a situation with inside the Green Party. The second hyperlink uh, was the uh, appellant's name, Wayne Crooks. Was, was the um, libel suit, which is underlined in the f first paragraph or the second paragraph, was that also a hyperlink? Or just the, uh, both of the material, both of the hyperlinked materials were subject to uh, action as well. So the open politics and uh, the Wayne Crooks hyperlinks. Just in, in terms of the, of the facts, are you going to discuss a little bit about the context in which these links are made? I, I think the article is at pages 172, 173 of the record, and it's got a whole lot of hyperlinks and different connections, but as I read the item, he's really talking about the role of libel and freedom of speech. That's his point in this piece. And the links you're referring to are part of the 
the content as he moves through this discussion, and then he talks about a concert to raise money and so on. Yes. So is that context not uh, important? The, the focus is on the general problem, as I understand it, as he sees it, of, of libel suits chilling speech. Well, of, of, of course, the whole of the context is important, but one, one element of the context that's very important, too, is that when the hyperlinks were created, the record shows that Mr. Newton knew that those hyper, the material on those hyperlinks was subject to suit. And so that's, from our respectful position, a, a very important element as well. Can we stick with that paragraph then for a moment? What do you say, there are two hyperlinks in that same paragraph, as someone to Wayne Crooks. Would you say then that um, anything that is found on the site, if it hadn't mentioned Wayne Crooks, that anything anyone found when they hyperlinked Open Politics CA would be the responsibility of the author of this blog? I'm, I'm sorry, Milady, I'm not sure I understand the well, question. The, the, what you're saying that this is an invitation. You, you, hyperlinking Wayne Crooks yes. is publication because it's essentially, you can draw the inference, or whatever you say the legal grid is that we put that on, it, it does invite somebody to come and it, it's a form of publication. That's correct. Uh, and therefore liability found in that article. So I'm asking you whether that applies as well for the hyperlink to Open Politics CA. Yes. So anything anybody would find on the Open Politics CA would be the responsibility of the author. No, no, not not anything. The, the site may contain a number of things, but if somebody's going to the site reading about an article about free speech in, in Canada on the internet, presumably they're going to search that site for the material related to free speech in Canada on the internet. And if it comes up with the material related to Mr. Crooks, then yes. The purpose, respectfully, of of that hyperlink is to take somebody to the site, which is, uh, I believe it's called U U.S. Governetics. Um, Why isn't it like... Open I, politics, I mean, Let me just stick with the footnote analogy that the court seemed to be so dependent on. Why isn't it like a footnote reference rather than... You can make a distinction between a footnote that says, see the article by, or a footnote reference that actually contains content. Isn't there a difference between the way you characterize the footnote hyperlink, and if you're simply referring to it. Well, so that and, and, and that has to do with the nature of hyperlinks. It, it's our position that when you hyperlink a particular thing in your main article, it's beyond just a neutral reference to it. It is, and you can use, as you, as you say, place it on a grid between invitation to endorsement. But it is, uh, it is saying to the reader, this Amongst all of the other stuff that I haven't hyperlinked, this is important. You should read this. It's um, unlike a footnote. The ordinary law of defamation has developed the principle of repetition. In other words, starting point is that the it, it, original creator of the defamatory material is liable, or then exceptionally third parties who uh, refer to that material can be liable if they repeat it. Now, just looking at the internet and hyperlinks in that context, the original here are the people who created the hyperlinked material. Does not, it, the question then becomes traditional model was it repeated in the text and um, you obviously say it doesn't have to be repeated any kind of link is sufficient but I want to know how you deal with the traditional requirement in the common law that there be actual repetition and not merely uh, some sort of link. Are you asking us then to change the common law with respect to this particular medium? No, no, my lady, I'm not. I, uh, and, and with part company, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the first observations that you made. 
when the hyperlink is created and you know, and the record shows, that the material that is on that hyperlink is subject to a, an action in defamation in any already, then respectfully, you're the originator because you are taking the reader there. Oh, you, uh, to put it in the context of the law that I was trying to develop, you would say that is a repetition by taking the yes. reader there. Yes. But in the context of the, uh, of the Internet, why shouldn't this signal be read as, for those who are interested, uh, there are all kinds of other information uh, through this hyperlink. So it's not necessarily uh, I bring everything in my article. It's just out there in the Internet, there are all kinds of information related to it, and this is one, just one. Um, I think that, again, the factual context of this case doesn't permit that uh, uh, neutral view of the matter when the material that is hyperlinked is something which is known to the person creating the hyperlink to already to be subject to an action. And I understand that in your approach, if, for example, I had, I had clicked on Google, Google Wayne Crooks, that Google would not be liable. That's correct. Because you would treat it as a kind of neutral uh, process of hyperlinking. Well, I think uh, to, to adopt some of the language utilized in, in the SOCAN case, for example, it, it's, Google's not a content provider. It's a neutral conduit. Uh, uh, it, it is not using that hyperlink in the, in the context, like the context which is alive in this case, where it's about uh, uh, Internet on the Internet. What do you make of the, I'm sorry. What do you make of, of the fact that there's no control over the hyperlinked material being changed? Would you say that's a matter of rebutting this presumption you're advocating? Or? Ab absolutely, Malady. I, I, frankly, th that's a troubling proposition. Uh, I think it can be met by, by saying that both the presumption or the inference can be rebutted by uh, uh, evidence to that effect, and you will see in the record that many of these sites have history uh, 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 pages which show when they've been amended, and et cetera. Um, but at the very least, the very least, the malleability of the material which is on the Internet, uh, certainly once you've been given notice, like uh, Mr. Newton was given in this case, and asked to take it down, certainly at that point, he should have taken it down. Well, are, are you saying that uh, defamation arises only when somebody asks you to take down No, something? no, I don't, I don't say that. I'm, I'm, I was responding to uh, Madam Justice's concern about the malleability of, I, I think, a far preferable position rather than to, than to create an exception in the law of defamation for, for uh, Internet hyperlinks, it's a far better position to say, well, that's a matter of the evidence if the material has been changed. Uh, uh, and, of, of course, in, in the context of this case, the evidence is that uh, Mr. Newton says he didn't read it. And we say, of course, that that falls far below the level of responsibility and protection for somebody's reputation that uh, uh, should be available on the Internet as can I everywhere just, else. Can I just ask you, some of the people on the other side have argued about indeterminacy, that you hyperlink to, to something and then it hyperlinks to something else and so forth. Is there a line drawing problem here? Uh, again, uh, Justice, I, I think that's a matter of the evidence, and the evidence in this case is it, 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 there is no indeterminacy problem. Mr. Newton knew what he was uh, hyperlinking to was, as a result of his conversations with other people, was material that was subject to him. Yeah, I, that may be so, but, uh, but if we're going to establish some kind of a principle relating to defamation and hyperlinking, uh, don't we have to look beyond that and establish a principle that's, that's reasonable and that will cover all reasonable situations? I, 
Can you just address the indeterminacy issue in principle? Well, uh, again, um, I, I think that would be a matter of the evidence. If it was a matter of uh, 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 the evidence showed that uh, uh, the author hyperlinked to this particular site uh, and then people moved from that site to another site to another site, there would certainly be for a, a basis for saying he wasn't liable. Can we get any help from any other jurisdictions on this? It strikes me that we're being asked to take from existing jurisprudence and statutes an approach to something which is a completely different animal and which has been, I gather, dealt with as a different animal in the United States and in Europe. Is there any, any assistance you can give us based on what some of the other approaches have been to problems like indeterminacy, malleability, et cetera, and defamation? Well, the, the, the difficulty is, is that uh, uh, some of those comparisons are fraught with difficulty because, of course, they are statutorily based. For example, in the, in the U.S., uh, uh, hyperlinks, there appears to be an exemption for them under the relevant legislation. Uh, uh, they appear to be dealt with uh, in, in some respects in the law of Great Britain as well. And then, of course, the law of Great Britain requires substantial publication. Uh, un unfortunately, there isn't a lot of guidance for this court on this particular issue in the context where we do not have that statutory overlay that would relate uh, uh, to this issue. And uh, uh, Shouldn't we uh, take care not to conflate the, um, the publication and the defenses that could relate to repetition, uh, uh, responsible journalism or reportage? If we, what you're asking us to address is the first segment. Absolutely. Like the, was there a bilateral communication? Yes. But by inviting us to look at all this context, you're trying to take some kind of elements of the defense, it seems to me, and to bring it uh, uh, in the first segment. Well, I, I, I hope I haven't done that. Uh, what I had intended to do largely in, in my responses was to say that whether or not publication occurs, either by presumption or by inference, is going to be a matter of this particular context, hyperlinks on the Internet, what do they mean, what do they stand for, plus the evidentiary record. But insofar as you talk about uh, knowing the content you are really getting into the, the substance of the defense of innocent dissemination, uh, it seems to me. And uh, following up on my colleague's well, problem or point, I have the same problem insofar, particularly the defense of innocent dissemination, which, which, require, which looks at uh, were you just passing it on or did you have reason to know that this was defamatory? Well, uh, uh, as, I, as I said, my lady, the the facts in this case are is that Mr. Newton knew that these sites. But the question is when we consider that. I mean, is it enough at the beginning just to show he, he published whatever in the traditional way and then it would be a defense um, to show innocent. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes, I'm not a, 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 I hope I'm not perceived as asking you to conflate the two because I, but I'm just I don't then think having, that would be appropriate. I'm just having trouble seeing how we work in this element of knowledge and so on into um, the first element of, of defamation, which is the availability. Either this person makes it available or they don't make it available the way we would traditionally approach a defamation yes. problem. We don't start off by asking, you know, did the defendant really no, et cetera. We say, did they make it available? And then at the tail end, we bring in knowledge and negligence, perhaps, et cetera, through the defenses. You seem to be bringing knowledge in at the beginning, and that's no, what I'm no, not I'm understanding. I'm sorry, I, I, that wasn't my intention. I, I don't think that would be appropriate. I think that, that uh, uh, the use of a hyperlink comes freighted with all sorts of uh, uh, other elements, and that's what makes it publication. It's, it's the nature of a hyperlink. I'm not asking you to find that a hyperlink is per se communication because of the peculiar facts of this case. I say it is presumptively communication, I mean uh, publication, I'm sorry, uh, because of the nature of a hyperlink. And if it's not presumptively 
uh, a, uh, an act of publication, then in the facts of this case, you could draw the inference that it's a publication, and, and the facts of this case need not involve, uh, and nor did they involve in the in the dissenting judgment, uh, any reference to the knowledge uh, that these sites contain defamatory material. So all they have to do is have selected uh, it, when, something to hyperlink. When you select something to hyperlink, you uh, uh, distinguish it from the material that you haven't hyperlinked, and there's not probably tons of it, and you would not only invite, you encourage, uh, uh, although I don't believe that the law of publication requires it to be an encouragement or an endorsement or any of the other things which some of the interveners advocate for as the, as the test. It just has to be an act of publication. And I say the act of publication can be presumed or inferred. That's it, because in, in, in this case, the big problem is not so much the making uh, the, the, the making the, the, the information available is the whether there was any person who, it, who actually read it and the you, you rely on the dissent but the dissent relied heavily on the number of hits on the primary site but that doesn't say anything about the hyperlinked site so in the context of the hyperlink, and that's the position of the majority, since it's worldwide, since people will do all kinds of research, the primary site doesn't tell anything or almost nothing about the, the fact that any person would have, ac have access. So we're asked to create a presumption out of very little facts. You're you're asked to create a presumption out of, in the same way that the presumption was utilized in the Gaskin case, where it was based upon the purpose of a credit report and assuming that the purpose has been achieved. And the purpose of a hyperlink is to induce people to go to that site. And I say that uh, uh, then it, it, it's a matter that follows logically uh, that you can presume that that purpose has been met because that was the purpose of the author of the hyperlink. So your and Gaskin from Gatley. That's correct. If he proves facts from which it can reasonably be inferred that the words were brought to the knowledge of some third person, he will establish a prima facie case. That's correct. So in the case of, for example, a bibliography at the end of the article, is that to you... If a, if a bibliography at the end of an article, uh, if it was an Internet article and it didn't have a hyperlink, then no presumption would arise. But this is in the text. This is not a footnote. This is in the text of the article. It's not in any way distinguished from the rest of the article by uh, uh, saying that... Uh, but you, you are not seeing see, uh, that the hyperlinked material becomes part of the original. That's case. exactly the point, Miller. That's it. And that, I, I believe that's in our factum. That, that uh, you've incorporated it by reference. If but, uh, but you're asking us from the fact that there have been a number of hits on this particular side that we should infer that the, the hyperlinked material has been read by someone. Um, that's my second, that's my alternative position. My, my main position is the presumption that it is part of the article. It is part of the text. The, the, the use of the words Wayne Crooks in the article are the same as any other part of the text, about which there's no debate about whether that is published, respectfully. But you're, uh, you just told me that, uh, that uh, you're, not, you're not asserting that uh, the, art, uh, the article to which re, uh, the, uh, the word Crooks referred was not part uh, was not part of the original uh, article on your site. I, I, I don't. Th I don't believe. If if you thought I told you that it isn't part. Yeah. No, I misspoke. It is part. Uh, it is part. Everything that uh, that is hyperlinked should be considered a part of the original article. De uh, depending upon the context of the use of the hyperlink within the text. 
it, I, I don't make that statement uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, in a, a broad manner saying any hyperlink that occurs on the Internet. Can I ask you a policy question then? You would be asking us to expand the law of defamation. If this had been an article in hard copy in a magazine somewhere, and at the end of the article there had been a list of the sources that were referred to, just a list, uh, Wayne Crooks, um, article on Wayne Crooks, open politics, etc., that would not necessarily be defamation, but because the way foot footnoting or bibliographies t are done in the context of uh, Internet articles and in incorporated through inter interlink, through uh, hyperlinks, that therefore they escape the protective net and could be included as defamation even though they might not be if it were just a footnote or a bibliography. Is that, is that a fair characterization? Uh, it's a fair characterization to this extent. In, in the printed word, you don't have a hyperlink. That's what I'm saying. No. So, so it, it, it's a, I, um, I don't think. It's the I'm, ease of access which creates the liability. Well, it's not ease of access. I say that when you put hyperlink in the text, it's part of the text. You started off by saying we should be trying to find a reasonable balance. That's correct. Uh, it seems to me that if we, if we take the position, we accept the position you're putting forth, that um, no one should ever hyperlink, because maybe I'm a chicken, but I, I, I would not dare create a hyperlink because uh, there might be some defamatory material and I'll be stuck defending myself in court. I frankly can't afford it from where I'm sitting here, so I'm, I'll never hyperlink. And my question to you, it doesn't seem to me to be a, a, a balance when we're talking about the Internet is a network. It, we're, we're giving, you know, we're, we're sentencing the hyperlink to death, it seems to me. So to help me with the well, balance uh, issue. Respectfully, I, I don't think you'd have to be too brave to just pick up on your analogy to, to have read the material and make a considered judgment in the same way that you require any other journalist uh, to uh, be responsible about the material they're referencing before they utilize it. But the first question, Justice Sabella was saying you, you, you don't draw a distinction between openpolitics.ca. So if I have a, I'm writing something and I'm referring, you can look up McLean's, I wouldn't dare do that because there may be something well, defamatory in there. No, no milady, I, I think what I said to Justice Sabella was that a person clicking on that hyperlink would be going to look for the material on Internet liable on, on open politics because that's the subject matter of the article. And then I don't think it's placing too onerous a burden on an Internet blogger to say, well, before you invite people to read the material uh, uh, about uh, these issues on, that, on openpolitics.ca, you ought to have been responsible enough to review it yourself and to make some judgments about it. Could, could I ask you to, to make a perhaps painful assumption just for a moment, which is that we didn't go with you on your, your broad proposition that the insertion of the hyperlink itself is incorporation. Assuming that is not the case, does the situation change once the hyperlinker, if I can use that word, uh, has knowledge of the contents? Um, yes, uh, uh, but as I said, the record shows he had knowledge of the contents from the outset. But I also understood your position to be that you didn't have to prove that to prove no, publication. No, no, you don't. So and, and, let's, and let's take the situation of hyperlink and you as counsel for your client draw to the attention of the person who's inserted the link that there, your position is there's defamatory material to be found on that link. At that point, does the situation as to publication change? Um, that, that's kind of two steps down the line. That's asking me to presume that there's no presumption, asking me to presume that there is no inference to be drawn without that fact as well. Yes, then I think that fact does make it publication. The, the, the notice. So that's something that starts out as not being publication is converted into publication? That's correct. There's knowledge. Is there any precedent to support that? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. It seems that you're exactly doing the conflation that 
I talked about earlier. You're taking elements of the responsible journalism, of the uh, repetition, of the innocent dissemination that goes to knowledge and to what the person actually did or knew into uh, the first segment, into the uh, defamation part? Well, my lady, if, let, let, me, let me address that this way. If we do not take into account the nature of a hyperlink and what it does in the doctrine of publication, then hyperlinking will be without limitation completely. And well, that is not an appropriate balance. I'm not sure anyone said that you can never have any evidence of publication. The interveners and the, the respondent addressed this situation where the only evidence led was to the was what the hits on the primary sites and well almost nothing else going to actually um, potential knowledge potential uh, evidence of um, uh, reading the secondary site. Well, uh, the issue then becomes whether or not if you set the bar with regard to use on hyperlinks as saying you require evidence of uh, uh, somebody having used, utilized the hyperlink, I'm not sure if that's available. It wasn't available and at least isn't part of the record in this case, but that again may well not be striking the appropriate balance because that may well not, respectfully, give proper credence to the, the role of a hyperlink and the fact that there were 1,700 and some hits. Well, I and, think and maybe that should be a matter for trial. Yeah, but I think it's one of the, in, one of the in, in some of the material, they said, well, after the posting of the, after the embedding of the hyperlink, uh, there was increased during the period of time of the hyperlink. So it, you don't need actual direct evidence, but at least you need some kind of um, element so that you can infer that the, uh, the material was read as a result of the hyperlink. Well, um, I would just say that simply that uh, from our perspective, the, the, the evidence relied upon by the uh, Justice Prowse writing in the minority should respectfully be enough to make that inference. When one takes into account the nature of a hyperlink, what its purpose is, and, and the fact that it was part of the text of the article. Can I uh, <clears throat> ask about the proposition that the hyperlink is itself one of these content neutral mechanisms uh, of the internet? Uh, because if, if this article had appeared in a newspaper and they referred to uh, litigation, defamation litigation going on between Mr. Crooks and Mr. Newton in the Supreme Court of British Columbia, and uh, the same kind of information was provided that somebody interested could pursue that and find out what it was all about and what the offending articles were, uh, the, the hyperlink is, is a means of streamlining and accelerating access to that information, but it does require the intervention of the user uh, to make a decision to make that uh, pursuit. Why shouldn't the hyperlink be seen as a, a mechanism, uh, an instrumentality of the Internet, which is, it, which is con content neutral in the sense that it uh, uh, is simply something invoked to assist the person who wants to pursue the topic. Well, respectfully, I don't believe that a hyperlink, when it's used as part of the text in the article itself, is content neutral, period. Well, it, but, but it's, uh, the, the hyperlink doesn't repeat uh, on its face uh, the material you complain about. And it gives you access to that material in a very quick and uh, easy manner. But that is uh, a mechanism. Uh, you read into the mechanism uh, the publication of the content. That's that correct. That seems to me to that's be the correct. problem. No, 
I mean, given that's the, the issue. You, you that's the issue, and, and given the nature of what a hyperlink is to do, and, and one can draw distinctions about all sorts of contexts in which hyperlinks are utilized. But when it's used as part of the text, then the material which it, and I'm going to use the word endorses, uh, I don't think I need to use it. I don't think that the law of defamation requires it to be an endorsement. We can call it an incorporation. We can call it an invitation. But when it is used as part of the text and the way it was used in this case, that material that is on that site is part of that article. It is part of the primary article. But, for example, you get there's a lot of lawsuits by Conrad Black against Tom Bauer on this book. Uh, and uh, a lot of the articles can be seen as an invitation to the reader uh, to read this book, uh, which is the subject of the libel action. It takes effort uh, for somebody to go out and buy the book. Uh, but what difference is there in terms of libel law uh, between the ease of access provided by the hyperlink and the invitation in a newspaper which requires more effort? Well, respectfully, I think it diminishes what a hyperlink is and its role to say that it's merely just ease of access. I say that the material that the hyperlink is to is part of the primary article. It's not a matter of access. Yes, there's a mechanical function involved, but in the context of a piece of internet blogging journalism, when somebody uses a hyperlink, they've made that, in the text, they've made that material part of their article. Like a footnote. Pardon me? And, and, and that's the different thing. It's not part of the text. Fine. I, I see I have 11 seconds, my lady, so uh, thank, thank you. you. Those are my submissions. Uh, Mr. Burnett. Chief Justice, Justices. The two issues in this appeal correspond, I say, to the two elements of this bilateral concept called publication. The first is whether there was a defendant who spoke or wrote the allegedly defamatory words. And in this case, that comes down to whether a hyperlink accomplishes that. The second part of the bilateral notion of publication and the second issue in the suit is whether a reader or listener received and comprehended the allegedly defamatory words, which in this case boils down to this question of whether the plaintiff, the appellant, can, can achieve that without proving anybody actually did, but based upon a presumption or an inference. I will be dealing with the first of those issues, and my colleague, Mr. Delaney, will be dealing with the second. It would be a mistake, I submit, to treat this question as one merely of definitions. I maintain that the question of, of who is a publisher and how far we cast that net on the internet is actually the most challenging and most important issue when it comes to internet defamation. In most cases when you're dealing with the actual author, and in this case Mr. Crooks has sued the, who, he, who he claims the, who the actual authors are, but that lawsuit has sat dormant for some four years. When you sue the actual author, it doesn't engage that issue. But when you engage this question of when you hold somebody liable for the words of somebody else, that's an extraordinary concept. You're going to hold somebody liable for someone else's expression. In traditional libel law, that situation has arisen in somewhat confined circumstances. Somebody who actually republishes, for example somebody who is vicariously liable, for example, or somebody who may not have written the words but acted in concert like a joint tortfeasor in, in, the, in, uh, in a design towards the expression. But the Internet has, is a paradigm shift which has dramatically expanded the circumstances in which one might arguably be responsible for somebody else's words. The hyperlink example is just one. There is the example of somebody who has a blog or a website that, in, that allows reader comments. Are they liable for the reader comments that get posted? There's the example of someone who's in the business of hosting websites. Are they responsible for the content of all the websites they host? Internet service providers, and the list goes on. 
On the Internet, communications are interconnected. They are two-way communications in many cases, a Facebook back and forth. And the, the links in the chain of communication are more complex and more numerous. But so they, all of these mean that the, the situations in which one might argue that, that a person should be held liable for the words of a third party could be, uh, are, are much more uh, complex and great. Can I take you back to your, your observation about what is the traditional situation if, if we're dealing with a newspaper or a book? The concept, as the Chief Justice said, of repetition is not, is not a, a very uh, novel one. It's built in. If you repeat a libel in an article that somebody else has done, you are responsible for that libel. Isn't that right? Yes. Okay, so the, the question isn't whether I mean, it's true that the Internet is a completely different animal and that we're dealing with a different universe, but isn't it really a narrow question whether an Internet hyperlink, which somebody in the course of writing an article expressly refers to, rather than blog comments that come in at the end of a Globe piece or something from outside readers, something you're in charge of, that you have control over, is that repetition for purposes of defamation. So I'm not sure how far it helps us to get into the fact that the Internet is a totally different universe. I think we know that. The question is, given that it's a different universe, how do we approach the question whether a hyperlink is incorporation or whether it is simply a reference that people may or may I think that is exactly right. That, that is the question on the first part of the bilateral test. My comments were designed to highlight the importance of this decision of how, how wide we cast the net. And do we cast it to hyperlinkers or the other examples was, is, is, is an important question as to th that affects freedom of expression on the net. That was the first book of those comments. But, but you're absolutely right. That the, the question is, was there a repetition of the, of the allegedly defamatory words? And you might have a hyperlink in a context where there is a, a repetition. Somebody says, well, I agree that so-and-so happened see this hyperlink and this is, you know, in which case you've got, you've got that accomplished. In the present case, it's common ground that not a single defamatory word was written by the, by the respondent. All, all there was were these two hyperlinks, both of which led to pretty substantial and ever-changing websites. Um, in, the, in the record and, and in my condensed book, I've included some of the history from some of those sites that shows that, that, that these sites, because, of, because in part, I suppose, of the libel threat that occurred long before Mr. Newton ever wrote his article, these sites began changing in response to that, and because, because of the nature of them, they're, they're Wikipedia-style sites where people contribute. So, so can it be said that by hyperlinking to, to the, the page or to the site that Mr. Newton is repeating the words within it? In my submission, no. And, and what that goes to... Um, in my submission is what, and much of the law of libel revolves around this, what does a reasonable reader understand from a hyperlink? Does a reasonable reader who sees a hyperlink on the internet understand that the person who has made the hyperlink is vouching for the credibility of what's on the other end of the hyperlink? No. Does a reasonable reader understand that the person who is hyperlinked has investigated the entire contents of what's on the hyperlinked site? No. Does he understand that the hyperlink was even made at, at a time when the site is the same as it is today? No. A reasonable reader that the law, the law revolves around is, is someone who, who understands in my submission that, that the, by hyperlinking, a person is making a reference and, and I, I maintain that the footnote analogy is, is very apt, that they're making a reference to further reading. They might hyperlink to, and there's some evidence from, for example, Professor Hamida about journalism today. Quite often you hyperlink to the very thing that you're criticizing. You might hyperlink to something so that readers can go there and, and judge for themselves your criticism of it. Or you might hyperlink to opposing views. But isn't that exactly the point? If this article... Isn't there a difference between your argument that essentially says this is neutral, go there if you want to, as if it were a footnote? What if this paragraph had said, I've just met Mr. Pilling, who runs 
open politics. I agree with what he says on his website and that the fact that he's being sued for defamation by Wayne Crooks, as in this uh, website, hyperlink is appalling or something, an endorsement, in other words. Would you say that that's the same as this hyperlink or that the words used surrounding the hyperlink help define whether or not it is, in fact, incorporation and repetition or whether it's something like a footnote? In, in, in my submission, that can make a difference. Both acknowledge that that might, might make a difference. There's a lively debate, I, I must say, uh, and a powerful argument to say that unless you actually repeat the words, you're not liable. But, but I don't go that far. I say that, 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 that the court needs to be careful about carving out an exemption that swallows the, that swallows the principle. But, but where there is an explicit knowing endorsement, and not of some great big site like Open Politics that has hundreds of articles, but of a particular aspect within that site, that that could put you in a position of liability. And it's, it's how it, how it um, responds to the repetition principle is, is, is I think, it, it's maybe a variant of, of the concept of true innuendo, where, where you're, you're, you're making a reference and, and you can then also prove that the audience knew what the reference was that you were agreeing with. You'd have to get both pieces of that puzzle. And, and on the Internet context, it may be that, that the nexus between your reference and, and, the, and the proof that somebody has taken your reference that you say you agree with, has followed your, the link, and has gone to the article and read the defamatory words, you'd, you'd need to follow, hit all those, connect all those dots, if I can put it that way. But, but as in, my, in my submission, that could put you there. But essentially, your position is, is, uh, is that hyperlinking, as such, is not publication. That's correct. That's correct. And, and, unless you have the on a, a, whether it is, let, let, uh, let's say, on a research engine, a blog, uh, except in very narrow circumstances, which uh, you described a few moments ago. Yes, that's, that's, that's exactly right. In, in the circumstances at bar, it, it, in many ways, it's, a, it's a, um, a nice case in point of the kind of thing that, that goes on on the Internet and the kind of thing that, in my submission, could be choked if, the, if, the, if there were liability for pure hyperlinks. You've got this man named John Newton, a man who's in court today of some retirement age, husband and father, lives in a small town, passionate about free speech, who, who otherwise would not, pre-internet, would be confined to living room discussions and letters to the editor, now can actually engage in this debate about free speech and alert people to a lawsuit that he considered to be very important on the subject and reference the material so people can go and read their own, their own, uh, um, and, and make their own decisions. He can engage with opponents. He can cite, he can cite matters which, which, uh, uh, which he might disagree with or, or he might agree with, or he, or he can simply cite them as in this case without making any comment as to agreement or disagreement. It's, it's that kind of person, and, and um, um, when Justice Sharon was talking about the, you know, being afraid to link, that's real in my submission. The, the, the real um, fear or chill that would be upon those who, who wish to hyperlink, um, big or small, a small fish like uh, Mr. Newton, you know, hardly able to deal with, with, the, uh, with, with the, what's involved in litigation, or, or a big fish like the Globe and Mail, who, who, will, who as a matter of journalism today, and you, as you see in some of uh, that intervener's evidence, you know, where linking is a, is a key part. It's no longer good enough in, in today's environment to simply talk at people or write at people. It's, it's, it's an engaging conversation. You, you give people a, a launching pad for going further and, and, and critically evaluating. In, in that you regard, that off, well, sorry. In that regard, do you distinguish? Do you distinguish between a hyperlink to a website and a hyperlink to a particular article on the website? In this case, as I understand the facts, there was one of each. Yes, the the hyperlink uh, in in this case there was a hyperlink in one, and then there was a hyperlink to an article which was, I wouldn't call it a short article. It was three or four pages when you print it out um, that one would have to read down. In, in my submission, uh, Justice Fish, it, it, it's the um, 
as one of the ingredients of the exception I described a few moments ago. You would need, you would need to, with the words surrounding or with the hyperlink itself, drill to the defamatory content. So you might say, you might go directly to the, to the actual defamatory, allegedly defamatory content, or you might, by virtue of your language, direct them to, you know, for example, I agree wholeheartedly with what is said on this website regarding, um, um, you know, Mr. Cook's honesty, let's just say. I mean, so so you, you would direct them either by language or by the link itself to something, to something specific. And, and, and short of that, you're asking, uh, I suppose it might be a matter for evidence, you're asking a, a court to say, well, a person went from the original site to the link to the article or the web page and then found and found the defamatory piece. The, the question raises something but that I've been... Unless I misunderstand you, you're adding a further element. A person to a, a single self-contained article which in turn, which contains defamatory matter. On your construct, that's insufficient. One must direct the person to the specific parts of that article that are defamatory. Is that your position? In my submission to, to take, to, 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 to get past the normal rule of actual repetition, that's what you would require. You would require, and, and whether it's directing them by the link pointing right to those, that, that, that aspect of the article, because this was a long article, relatively long, even, even the single one, or by, by language, saying that where they talk about so-and-so, I agree. Because if you start reading that U.S. Governetics article, there's all sorts of things. You, 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 it's quite a while before you get into any, anything that even could, in my submission, be a negative comment. So, so, you know, are you agreeing with, or are you, even if you say I agree, are you agreeing with some of the earlier things or the later things? By analogy, if you uh, hand someone a copy of an article, drawn from the Internet or from a printed source, and that article contains defamatory matter. Is it less, any the less publication if you don't underline the particular paragraphs or sentences that are said to be defamatory? In my submission, that analogy breaks down for this reason, that when you're handing somebody the actual article, you are a publisher. It's, it's like if you had, for example, on a website, an embedded automatic link that showed the article right there on your site. You were actually hosting it. That, there's a difference there between, between, between actually handing them the printout of the article and, and directing them there for their own reading by, by way of a link. Of whether, that, that doesn't really answer. I think that assumes the answer to the question whether when you provide a link to a specific article that is defamatory, that constitutes publication. Now, your answer is no, it doesn't, because hyperlinks don't. Um, you gave a variety of reasons, one of which was that you have no control over the material that is linked. It's a, maybe a general website. And so I asked you whether what you've said in that regard applies with equal force to a hyperlink that takes the uh, person who clicks on the hyperlink directly and specifically to the defamatory matter? Well, the, as I say, the, the, it, it, the, the difference in my submission is that it's, um, you would have to be fitting to what I say is an extraordinary exception where somebody is not actually delivering you the words or repeating the words. We're merely directing you where, where you might choose or not to, to read further. And, and in, those, in those circumstances, you would need explicit endorsement, endorsement that, that is specific to the defamatory words um, and, and knowledge of them. And that, that's my submission. One of the things that this points up in, um, in my submission is that the argument somewhat puts a hyperlink on a pedestal it doesn't deserve. What if Mr. Newton, in his article, had simply said, there's an interesting lawsuit um, involving Wayne Crooks and involving a website um, called Open Politics with no, with no hyperlink. Would it really make a difference? Could a person not just simply do a quick Google search and, and not only would they go to the articles or go to the Open Politics site, but they'd actually, in probably a quicker way, end up at the precise articles in question? 
So, so if my friend's argument is right, that this, this reference by hyperlink is, is like publication, well, why would that not extend to, to a reference by description? On the Internet, I mean, these are, these are, are, are degrees of convenience. On the Internet, you know, the, the, uh, the search engine really is the, is, the, is the powerful tool. How many people would get to that site by virtue of just doing a Google search of Wayne Crooks? As opposed to getting to a hyperlink, so so you know, would you would you say that that a well, my friend has acknowledged that, that a a printed word does not constitute repetition. In fact, I think they've they've acknowledged and certainly acknowledged below that that even listing the web address, if it if it was if it was just in text and not in a hyperlink, does not constitute publication. In my view, it, it's it's stretching matters to the breaking point to say that there's some magic about it being a link. There's some magic, and, and because, because I say it stretches the breaking point, because that magic is nothing more than convenience. It's nothing more than, than saying, you know, you can pull it up electronically right here as opposed to, as opposed to there it is on the shelf, you can go get it. it that, 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 to, to say that liability flows from the convenience you provided to somebody doesn't, doesn't what, flow uh, what you're essentially say, saying, to my mind, is that uh, hyperlinking is a, is a purely neutral uh, technical process to ensure the connectivity of the internet. Yes, yes. The, 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 in, put in simple terms, in, in, in direct and, and clean terms, that that's the. the, 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 the so, the, so, the, so that when you are hyperlinking, you are not publishing, you are not breaching anyone's copyright, nothing like that. That's right, and, and, and this, bear, this, is, this is what we've described as a normal hyperlink, right? A hyperlink that doesn't pull up the material. So when this court's decision in SOCAN um, came down and this, this important distinction was made between a hyperlink that, that brings up an embedded piece of content automatically as part of the, the defendant's website, that's a different story. That, that, that's, you're, you're presenting the material. If you're, if you're providing a path, a footnote, apply the analogy you like, if you're providing that choice, by definition, the reader must bridge it. The reader must say, okay, well, I'm going to now go to the library and get the book. I can just do it by a click. Does that, does that change if you approve, does that neutrality lose the neutrality if you approve of what it is that you're hyperlinking to? In my submission, as I was saying, the, the, the the, lower, the courts below allowed for that kind of exception, and I would too. I would urge the court, however, to, to recognize the importance of drawing that narrowly and, and, and with a bright line. Why does that go to publication? Well, I mean, I, I, you, you, so you approve. I mean, why, why, if, if this thing isn't actually printed by you and isn't repeated by you, and all that you're doing is saying, I, I approve or you should read this or something, uh, why does that change the dynamics of the hyperlink? Well, I, well I, my submission, first of all, you would need to go much further than just saying, you should read this, or I approve. It, it needs to be a, little more, a, lot, a lot more clear and specific than that. And, and maybe I can use this comparison to explain my reasoning. If you had a man on a, on a radio talk show uh, who was a guest who expressed some view that the, the, the mayor was corrupt, and right then and there, the talk show host, you know, a man of great credibility with his audience, for example, said, I agree wholeheartedly with what you just said. If the talk show host was sued for libel for adopting the comment that the audience, in that, in that simple case, would have just heard, it would be hard to resist liability in that circumstance, even though they haven't explicitly gone through and repeated the actual words, because they've endorsed by reference something which, on that simple example, the same audience would have just heard and would understand to be connected. So you take that example and you, you stretch the nexus a little bit. You've, you've got endorsement, which I say has to be explicit, to, to words which, um, which are not on the same talk show but on a different website and, and are in a different context. So it's, as, as, as you stretch the nexus out, 
or, or the distance between the two out, the, the level of, of explicitness of the agreement, the endorsement, and what you're talking about, I, I think, needs to be that much greater in order to reach the same conclusion. Does it mean that uh, – does it go to the question of whether somebody reads it or not? Is that the idea? Well, well that, that, that you're making it available, uh, and because you endorse it, you infer that somebody reads it? No. Th that, that's a separate element that there's a burden on as well. So, so in my analysis, there's these two elements of publication, both of which, which the plaintiff has to prove, both of which they failed on below. And so in, in my submission, if, if, if there was – um, if there was an explicit, specific, knowing endorsement of a defamatory comment, but no evidence somebody read it, there's no liability. You, have, you haven't met the second part of the bilateral test. Flipping it around, if you had tons of proof that people had, had gone through, and, and on my first issue, I'm assuming, for the sake of argument, that people clicked through and found the content and read it and read the parts that are alleged to be defamatory, but I say if, if, if the link itself that took them there did not explicitly and specifically endorse the content, there wouldn't be liability because the first part wouldn't be met. Can I take you back to the first part? Because I'm having the same difficulty my, uh, my colleague expressed. Uh, why does approval go to publication? Um, the, it, it, it seems to me in your radio example, you have a statement out there, uh, a defa one defamatory statement published clearly out there, and then someone else says, I agree wholeheartedly, so you get two defamatory statements published out there. But the problem, it's a different situation where you have to, the statement that you're approving is not out there already in the reader's face. It, 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 you have to click to get it. Uh, and so I don't see your analogy as terribly helpful. And, and logically, Either you publish or don't, whether you're just saying, I like it, I approve it, doesn't, to me, seem to go to publication. It may go to other things, I don't know, but I'm having difficulty making that link. Right, and, right. A, and, I'll, and a second concern I have about using uh, adoption or, is that it does tend to, I think, uh, be a difficult criterion for a test for publication. Different people can disagree on how clearly you have to adopt or what words constitute adoption. So we would be right at the front end, uh, arguably, and this is just for you to respond to, uh, putting in a test that maybe doesn't logically seem to connect and secondly might be difficult to apply. Okay. With respect to the, the first point, Chief Justice, the um, implicit in my answer is is that the, the, the plaintiff will have proven both the elements of publication. So, so by a, an endorsement would, in my submission, not it would, it would go nowhere unless you also prove that somebody then took the endorsement, followed the link, read the defamatory. So you'd have to have both, both pieces of the bilateral aspect. I agree, but with, I still have the but, difficulty. Yes, and, and, and with respect to the second point, the, um, I agree that, it's a, that, that, that there's, a, there's a great difficulty and danger in trying to say, well, what is sufficient endorsement? Is it, unless there's repetition, why would you have liability? I would be happy, and it would be a, 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 a good thing for freedom of expression on the Internet to have a rule that is just simply, if you don't repeat, you're not liable. I'm trying to respond to the, the um, comments from the jurists below that, that there may be a circumstance. and. And, and I have to say, I can't foreclose entirely that there could be a circumstance. Um, it certainly would, would be, be clear to the law and would help out. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not asking the court to, to, uh, to restrict in that way. I'm, I'm, I'm allowing for a possibility. I think there's a bit of a, a problem just in terms of the balance between the public interest and in reputation and the Internet. If you take something like the uh, Zundel site, uh, Ernst Zundel, uh, there's all sorts of stuff on that site, but there were also a lot of links to quite poisonous material about individuals. And uh, could one con construct a site so that on the face of it there was nothing actual defamatory in what was being said, but the whole purpose and, and effect of the site 
was to uh, focus uh, harassment or to defame particular individuals, but identified through these. It seems to me that the, the construct might be open to great abuse. Free speech is open to abuse. And, and in my submission, um, Justice Binney, the, 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 what that helps us focus on is, is where is the harm to reputation? The harm to reputation in my submission is, is on the source document. A hyperlink doesn't preserve anything. A hyperlink doesn't replicate anything. If the source document is, is, is removed by virtue of, of court action or otherwise, the link needs, leads nowhere. And so this construct that you've, you've described certainly is something that, that would, would be a very concerning thing. And yet the solution is not with the hyperlink. It, the solution is, is, is to go after the source. Well, but, but then your question is to totally exculpate the, the orchestrator of this attack on somebody's reputation. Well, I, in my submission, if you had evidence um, and I think the Canadian Civil Liberties Intervention refers to this kind of situation. If you had evidence that a person was using a hyperlink as a device and was, it was in fact part of the, 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 both the source and the links were part of a, of a bit of a devious campaign to try to avoid liability, that, that, that may well, may well be a situation that you would, that you would uh, carve out an exception. In, in, in effect, you've got somebody who's, who's a joint tortfeasor in the tort of, uh, that, that, that is, that is, uh, embedded in the original source in my submission there. Consider for a moment, and it, uh, we have been, but let me just sort of focus on it, the implications if a person were to be considered a publisher merely for linking in terms of the, the chill on the internet. And, and what that does as a, as, a, as a fundamental matter to protect reputation. When, the, when it's the source document that is, that is the true harm to the, to the reputation. The link is, is merely one of many ways to get there. And the easier way is probably this Google search that I mentioned before. And so when we come to balancing reputations and free expression, the, um, the, the, it, is, it is the source that truly is, is what uh, affects the reputation. Does notice change anything? Because that's one of the positions my, my friend takes, that notice somehow puts you in knowledge and makes, makes what, you, what you have uh, linked to your own publication. In my submission, it doesn't, it, 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 there's no logic to the, to the argument that somehow notice bootstraps you into a position from, being no, from not being a publisher, from, from missing one of the two essential links or both of the bilateral concept, to being a publisher. Notice changes nothing. Notice may well go, as, as came up in questions earlier to my friend, notice may well go to other issues like innocent dissemination at a later date when we're dealing with defenses. Chief Justice, Justice, I'd like at this point to turn uh, the podium over to my colleague, Mr. Delaney, who will deal with the second part of the bilateral test and whether or not there ought to be an inference or a presumption. Justice, Justices, the appellants come to this court asking that a plaintiff in a libel case, in the circumstances of a hyperlink, can obtain damages without proving that a third party has read the defamatory comments based on either an inference or a presumption. In this case, for words that were not written or published by Mr. Newton. We say that it should not be the case that a presumption or an inference of a third party receiving words is enough in the context of a hyperlink or of the Internet generally. 
I just tell you what my concern is. We've, we've heard most of the morning arguments about why we should take into account uh, in looking at this whole area the fact that there is a real difference between the Internet and ordinary publication and we should be sensitive to what the, it, it, the, the hyperlink does. Now you're saying we shouldn't take into account the fact that it's different because you can't really tell on the internet whether or not somebody's received it and you draw normal inferences from the fact that a hyperlink applies. I'm not, not really sure what you're inviting us to conclude. Like why can't you draw inferences? I, I submit that in the circumstances such as a case like this or in the internet generally, the backbone or the underpinnings to the inferences that might be drawn is fraught with difficulties that suggest there is no reliability to lead to an inference being drawn. In the circumstances of this case, for instance, uh, to, to draw an inference that there was publication of the actual defamatory terms in the articles contained in either of the two open source or the other uh, website, it would require that there is a presumption that a human being went to Mr. Newton's site as opposed to a robot. There would have to be a presumption then that that individual clicked on the hyperlink to the open politics site, for instance, and I recognize the difference between the two uh, sites, but went to the open politics site, then searched past the home page of the open politics site to find the articles regarding Mr. Crooks, and that they read the actual words that were allegedly defamatory and read them to be that way. What, what, what if you... Sorry. Go ahead. I was going to ask you this. We got 1,788 hits here. What if there were a million hits? Would it still be no inference that somebody in those million didn't go through all the steps that you're talking about? In my submission, yes. There is no causal connection on the, the facts before this Court, and I'll deal with one other aspect of it in a moment, Justice. But there is no causal connection that the hit led to the reading of the site through the link. It could be that a hit on Mr. Newton's site led generally to an, aware, um, an awareness of Mr. Crooks that was then put into a Google site. But when you buy a newspaper or a book, you don't have to, sh the inferences that are drawn that Gatley refers to that, that was used in Gaskin, you don't have to show that somebody who bought a newspaper or a book actually read what was in it that was defamatory. Why wouldn't that be the case, as Justice Rothstein said, where you've got a site which it appears 1,788 people have gone to? Why can't you also draw an inference that someone may have read what was in that network newspaper? Uh, uh, two responses, Justice. The first is the, the, the Gaskin case in my submission deals with an inference, not a presumption. A and secondly, on that case, or in this case, there is a quantum leap I suggest between an inference that somebody read allegedly libelous comments on Mr. Newton's site based on the number of hits to that site, as opposed to they read other articles that a conscious choice had to be made to link to at documents that were not created or controlled by Mr. Newton. And equally in this case, as opposed to the example that uh, you gave me, Justice. In this case, there is uh, a risk that the nexus of when the, the hit was done to Mr. Newton's site, that the content that was linked to was very different. So we're unable to draw the conclusion as to what the person actually saw when they hit the link. How does the, con how does the concept of repetition work? in connection with articles on the, uh, on the Internet? Well, it is our submission that uh, Mr. Newton is not repeating the articles. They are independently published by Open Politics or the, the secondary site. We are merely providing access to those sites for which they are responsible. 
But if we look at the 1,800 hits to Mr. Newton's site, we don't know when they occurred as opposed to what the actual record of what was reviewed looked at. In the condensed brief on behalf of Mr. Newton, you can see all the changes that were made to the various publications. So if we're looking to, to draw a conclusion, whether it be an inference or a presumption, we run the risk that we don't have the facts to do it. And it's not the case, such as Gaskin, where there was one document that wasn't changing, that was fixed in time, that there was an inference that may or may not have been accepted ultimately by the jury. We have stepping stones, or, or the, the fundamental backbone to the assumptions and the inferences that are changing, and also draw in the human dynamic of did the person actually choose to go to the source at that time? Is, so it's fundamentally different, I see. Is probability sufficient to draw the inference? Uh, I submit that given the, the difficulties in an area such as this where there is linking, probabilities are not enough. There needs to be actual evidence that somebody saw and read the articles in question and the words in question. In the example I gave before, for example, let's say it was on Mr. Newton's uh, site for 10 days, and during that period in time there was an increase of <coughs> a thousand its to Wayne Crook's link. There could be uh, some kind of inference <coughs> that the only explanation for this link would be uh, for this increase in uh, hits would be the hyperlink. Uh, I would submit that that's not an, a necessary conclusion in the circumstances. There are a myriad of reasons why there could be increased hits to either Mr. Newton's site or anybody else's site. It could be talked about by a third party. Mr. Newton's name could come up in a different context and people want to Google him. It, it, there is not the necessary link between the hits to his site. You can also always in circumstantial evidence think of uh, excluding every single possibility. But there you're asking for direct evidence and you're not accepting that there could be like inferences drawn? I, I, I think my primary submission is that if we analyze the decisions below in this case, the primary factor for the inference was the number of hits. And I don't think that is a sufficient factor to be taken into account for the purposes of an inference or a presumption, because there are so many other complications the with the hits. The majority said it's not sufficient that we have the number of hits on the primary site, but in the, in the example that I gave you was inference drawn from increased uh, hits on the secondary sites. But we have no control over the secondary site or where or how it is accessed by other individuals. And in the case of the secondary site here, it was changing as well. It could be that something changed on the site that became of interest to the public generally that caused a spike in the number of hits to the secondary site. So if we look at the, the, the hits as opposed to actual proof, the hits don't really tell us anything. I suppose it's just general, but in a lot of interactive sites, people would be writing in and saying, I checked on that link. Direct proof that they had actually done it. Yes. And, and in the But this wasn't interactive? Or uh, there actually was an opportunity on uh, Mr. Newton's site oh. to have an interactive discourse. But that, that leads to the, the second issue. Um, why would we have a presumption or an inference in this case? There are many presumptions and inferences in the area of libel already. And if we're talking about balancing free speech versus the protection of an individual, why do we need to add one more? But you're asking to us to go even further. That means that to exclude from this, kind, from this area of the law inferences. Uh, I, I am, Justice, or at least I, I'm asking this court to say that the number of hits should not be utilized for an inference. Let's just go back to the characterization of the hyperlink. If it's a footnote as a reference, then it would be probably the case, wouldn't it, that the fact that somebody's read the article doesn't create an inference that they've gone out and read the footnote. 
if, on the other hand, there's a content to the footnote which suggests an endorsement, this comes back to the discussion, an incorporation of the, um, of the article or a, an invitation that it's it, not simply a reference, an invitation to actually read it, that that creates a different kind of inference? Uh, I respectfully submit no, because somebody could just as easily go and look at the footnotes as they could hit the hyperlink. Uh, Dealing only with the question of inference. So you're saying no inference could, the same kinds of inferences can be drawn from footnotes as hyperlinks. You can't draw an inference. You're asking us not to draw an inference number of hits yes. about who read the hyperlink. Yes. But that is, but you can or can't draw inferences from the fact of a footnote reference. I would say you can't draw an inference on, okay. on the footnote. Okay, so that's the analogy you're drawing. Yes. And, and if we look again at, at the type of evidence that could be brought forward to a court, the Internet is actually uh, supportive of a plaintiff coming forward because there is electronic records of who went where and when. And in this case, uh, Mr. Crooks has sued the open politics people. He could seek their internet traffic and where it came from and has chosen not to. And that issue has been front and center for three years. So, so if, so if uh, Mr. Crooks had produced evidence of, uh, of somebody who clicked on, on or hit on his site having gone through the hyperlink and the time when the allegedly defamatory material existed, that would satisfy uh, uh, publication and receipt? And there would be defamation? Uh, no. It, it would satisfy most of the test but not all of the test, because we still need that somebody read the words. And I submit it's more than just making them available. It is that they read the words as well. Well, but uh, okay. Justice Abella said that uh, in a newspaper, if, if, it, if it contains something defamatory, you don't have to prove that the person actually read that article. Uh, I understand th th that position. I submit that the, the bilateral test requires that the individual read the words that are defamatory. Would you need actual evidence bringing Mr. So-and-so and asking him, well, did you read this or that? Yes. And, and I submit one so, uh, so it would be on one part of the law where it, it would not be possible to draw inferences based on a balance of probabilities. Could you tell me why we should have such a rule? Uh, I submit that a, a, an inference drawn on the basis of the number of hits is fraught with difficulty and should not be used for the purposes of either a presumption or an inference. The hits don't tell us why anybody went to the site, but what uh, they saw. To, when to get back to some of the comments and questions of my colleague, Justice uh, Deshaun, evidence of patterns of, of uh, traffic after, hyper, after a particular hyperlink or after the posting of particular material. Would this be relevant? I, I submit no. It would not be. It is merely a factor until there is proof of whether there was a direct link between the posting on Mr. Newton's site and the increase in traffic to the secondary site and what was there when that posting occurred. So I'm, I'm clear on your position because you say if there was evidence of a hit on Mr. Newton's article plus a hit on the Wayne Crooks, you say it would not be sufficient. Uh, you'd have to bring evidence that the person actually read the article. So is it your position that uh, any kind of uh, presumption that he read it would be a matter for the legislature and not something that could be drawn from facts? Or? Yes, ju just as the legislature in British Columbia has dealt with it in a number of areas under Section 2 of the Libel and Slander Act, it is a matter for legislative uh, approach. Uh, to that end, there is, of course, a difference between 
a presumption and an inference. And there was a question asked of my learned friend as to whether or not this had been dealt with in any other jurisdictions. And the presumption of publication on an internet link has been rejected in the United Kingdom. And that uh, has happened on uh, several uh, decisions, the Al Moody and the Brissard case, which is tab one of the respondent's material, uh, relying on Jamil and Dow Jones at tab 15, and Metropolitan and International Schools at tab 19. So there is some authority for the uh, proposition that a presumption is not accepted. Regarding whether or not an inference should be accepted, it was certainly addressed by the courts below. Uh, it was also addressed in the Broussard decision. And in that case, although it wasn't dealing with hyperlinks, the court did address the area of an inference. But there is all kinds of legislation, isn't there, talking about liability once notice? I appreciate that's uh, your, your friend's argument. Once notice is brought to the attention of somebody who is deemed to be a neutral provider, that different obligations kick in? Well, I would submit that notice makes no change at all to whether or not a third party has read the material. Notice deals with possibly the first part of the, the bilateral test, the publication, but doesn't deal with the second part of the test, whether a third party has knowledge of the alleged defamatory comments. So it's a distinct issue, I submit, under the second part of the test and is not relevant to the second part of the test. Now, dealing uh, with the court below, the court below did deal with inference and found that an inference could not be brought in this case on the basis of 1,800 hits. And we submit that if an inference is appropriate to, to be considered, that the court below, and in fact the trial judgment, was correct on that in that the Court of Appeal looked primarily at the number of hits, but also it looked at whether or not there was a way to assess the volume of hits as to a norm, whether there was any unusual behavior of Internet readers, and there was simply no evidence put forward. So in the disposition of the very case before this Honorable Court, there would be nothing to draw an inference of any publication under the second part of the test regarding the hyperlinks made by Mr. Newton. Could you not have the original article framed in such a way as to be such a clear invitation to uh, utilize the hyperlink? Uh, for example, if the article without that information wouldn't make much sense that one could infer from hits on the P2P uh, site that there had been use of the hyperlinks. Well, I, I submit that uh, there is actual proof that could be available for that, so we shouldn't be drawing an inference. No, but assuming actual proof isn't led, and I accept that in many cases it would be available if it was looked for. I'm just wondering whether short of that, certain inferences can be drawn from the way in which the article Sudan is framed and its use of hyperlinks. I would submit that uh, as a starting point, if the hyperlink itself is not a publication under the first part of the test, we don't have to look at the second part of the test at all. There are two requirements that the appellant needs to overcome. But assuming that the first part of the test is that there is some form of publication by, the, uh, by Mr. Newton in this case, uh, what you would look at contextually to draw an inference may depend on the circumstances. And if an inference is accepted, uh, the linking and the time of the link would at least overcome the factual obstacle of what evidence and what comments were actually looked at. But in, in my submission, we would have to, therefore, look at not only the number of hits, not only the invitation, but what was the invitation and what did it link to? to try to determine whether or not there was an actual reading of the defamatory comments. You couldn't just frame the article. You still have to look to where the article goes, when it goes there, and what is found when it gets there. 
Isn't the example given by Justice Benny akin to someone abusing the hyperlink? It's like try, trying to hide behind a mechanism that's uh, normally um, neutral in order to avoid liability. So you would not need to go through all this kind of context that you're talking about if it's abusing the hyperlink that's just part of the, uh, the facts. Well, um, as my colleague pointed out, uh, free speech is sometimes a difficult issue. But what we're looking for is whether or not the test of publication has been met. And if people frame their, their websites in such a way that publication is not met, we should not infer it or presume that the facts that otherwise would not meet the test become that in my submission. It's almost a bootstrapped argument, so we can't go anywhere else, so we'll try to find it through this direction. When the primary source can be sued, and in the facts of this case has been sued, for the actual comments that were made. Uh, I submit that a further potential issue, if there is an inference or a presumption is that it reverses the onus pragmatically without the necessary need. If we look at an inference drawn simply by the number of hits, or if that's the primary factor, as soon as the original source statistics are known, there would be, I submit, more than an inference but a presumption that the hyperlinks have been followed that they have been read by a human being following through on the links. And I submit that that oversteps the protections that are needed for somebody who has been potentially libeled. I, I think you may be taking that proposition a bit far personally because I think circumstantial evidence has always been accepted to prove a result uh, and you can say, well, it's really a presumption because nobody has actually seen it, but we accept that every day in the court, that you can have surrounding circumstances which allow you to get to a critical element on a balance of probabilities. We don't call it a presumption. I, I, I accept that, my lady. I just I, I would suggest there is a very real danger if the hits are what is the, the backbone of that that inference because it effectively becomes a presumption. Just what, one question I had, because you said um, at one point there would be actual proof of that, and, and, and to what extent should we look at that, the availability of actual direct evidence of someone actually uh, clicking on the hyperlink? What I'm thinking of is often we'll go to circumstantial evidence to prove a fact um, some facts, that's the only kind of evidence that we can look to. Um, should this be a factor, like the extent to which it, it could be proven that someone actually uh, used the hyperlink and, uh, uh, and I don't know, <laughs> or the fact that if in a, an interactive uh, site that they've responded and in the absence of that it makes the, any circumstantial evidence uh, less, uh, you know, less worthy to draw the inference. I, I, I would submit that, that you're accurate in that. If, if the evidence is available, why are we creating a shortcut for the plaintiff? It becomes a disincentive. The, the evidence would, which in your view would be sufficient, um, goes beyond establishing that a person, an individual, by means of the hyperlink on your client's website, access the defamatory material. You would require, in addition, as I understand it, that having accessed the defamatory material, proof be made that the person read it. Is that wrong? No, do I, I mis do I misunderstand your position? No, I I, I agree that That's your simply position. accessing the just website. as if one has a defamatory article in a newspaper. One has you have to establish in order to establish publication that the defamatory or that the newspaper delivered to another person's door and placed in that person's hand 
was actually read in order for publication to be complete. That's your hypothesis. I, I submit that there is a, a difference in the hard content being delivered, the newspaper, than a website that is ever-changing that we don't know what people would look at and what pages they would look at and what contact they would You see, to some extent, very much, I think, like the Chief Justice, it seems to me that it's one thing to uh, suggest that in drawing inferences, we ought to take into account the particular nature of hyperlinks. It's quite another to suggest that inferences cannot be drawn. And that seems to be your position. You say there must be direct evidence. That would do violence to general propositions of law. Moreover, to say that it's insufficient, that the direct evidence presumably established probability or the indirect evidence established probability would again be contrary to a basic principle of law, of the rule of law of evidence. So it seems to me that your argument uh, with respect, speaking for myself and not drawing a conclusion, might be more attractive if you were to say that in order to attain probability, an inference drawn from the mere number of hits uh, doesn't, doesn't rather attain the probability, doesn't meet that threshold, and so the inference would be unreasonable. That would fit nicely if that proposition were accepted into the rules of evidence and the general principles of establishing liability, tort liability, or any other liability in a civil claim. That's not, you're going much further than that. Uh, with respect, uh, Justice, uh, I started with that very proposition and then expanded it when beyond that. So I did put forward the proposition that you shouldn't, uh, it would be unreasonable to accept an inference based on the number of hits for all the reasons that I've discussed already. Would not be unhappy to have misunderstood your submission. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you, Justice. Uh, so we come back to the, the fundamental issue: is why should the presumption be accepted in a case like this when there actually is the availability of proof that hasn't put put forward? And we. I think your your time is up. But uh, is there another point you wish to make? Uh, just in closing, my lady, mm -hmm. uh, hyperlinks are vital to the expression and uh, the use of the Internet. They don't replicate, create, or distribute publications. And in the circumstances, the cost to expression would be too great to find that there is a link from the hyperlinking directly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the court will take its morning recess.
Ms. Matheson. Thank you, Chief Justice. I appear for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, and my submissions are focused on the question of whether publication should be expanded to include the provision of a hyperlink to someone else's speech. Our position is that it should not. To add people who provide hyperlinks to the already long list of publishers would be a substantial expansion of the law of publication at the cost of freedom of expression and unwarranted in our submission. I will not be addressing the second issue, which is whether there should be a presumption or an inference. Now, the appellant submits to this court that people who participate in speech on the Internet must act responsibly. And to which I say, yes, people should be responsible for what they say. But this appeal raises the question of whether people must also be responsible for what someone else has said when they themselves have not spoken, written, or otherwise uttered the alleged defamatory speech. And that is the, the premise of this appeal, and in my submission, uh, that is that that proposition should be rejected. Our core submission is that it should remain a necessary first step before finding anyone a publisher that he or she has actually spoken the words, written the words, sent the words, repeated the words, and are already part of what defamation law calls the chain of publication. I'll limit my oral submissions to two points. I first want to address the proposition that hyperlinks change the law because they are fast and because they're easy, which in my submission is an oversimplification of the technology and that this court should take into account the technology as a whole if it's going to consider the technology. My second point will relate to the proposed exception based on concepts like endorsement, recommendation, approbation, and adoption, which I will submit collapses when you realize that it calls for a consideration of all the surrounding circumstances. We've heard it over and over again this morning. You have to consider the context. You have to consider the circumstances. You have to consider, as the appellants put it, all of the evidence. And it will be my submission that any test that is so unpredictable should be rejected by this court because it is simply too difficult for people to know in advance whether they are able to exercise their right to freedom of expression or not, and when they will become a publisher of someone else's speech. So if I can just urge the court in favor of a bright line test for publication that ordinary people can understand and predict in advance, because anything else will substantially impair the freedom of expression of ordinary people who we wish to have the benefit of freedom of expression on the Internet. Let me then go to my first point. Should the speed and ease of a hyperlink transform someone into the publisher of the speech at the other end? So then uh, uh, might I ask you what would be your bright line test? Our bright line test, uh, Justice LaBelle, is that the person must have actually spoken the words. They must come within the current definition of publisher. They spoke the words, they wrote the words, they repeated someone else's words, they sent the words to a person. All of those people would today be publishers and should remain publishers, and the line should remain there. So there's no difference in your view between a person who incorporates by re references uh, another article and the network provider? A network provider is part of the chain of publication, uh, so the network provider is already a publisher. Um, their network provider then has various defenses that it can assert to, re to um, defend its responsibility based on lack of knowledge and so forth. But, you know, the, uh, the Internet service provider is already a publisher. Your test in paragraph 40 says the defamatory words are either on that person's website or blog or they are not. That's right. It sounds very simple. The question, though, to me is when it's in an, in an article, is it in your, on your website? Well, in this case, Your Honor, for example, there are three articles that the plaintiff complains of. In each of the three articles, there are a, f a few sentences or, or more that are allegedly defamatory. Those articles were published. They were published on the, 
openpolitics.com site and the, and the second site, and the publishers of those articles have been sued. The question here, and is, it is admitted, is that Mr. Newton's article contains none of those words. And our position is that in those circumstances, there is no publication by him. There are publication by others. Those people can be sued for defamation, and that is, in our submission, the route to take. And that route has been taken in this case as well. L let me look at the technology point. Yes, uh, hyperlinks are fast and easy, uh, but that isn't all that the court would have to consider because they don't exist in isolation. Hyperlinks are part of the Internet. And the first thing we know, and is simply uncontested, is that hyperlinks are everywhere. You have evidence before you that some years ago there were over a trillion of them on the Internet. There are over a thousand in the very small number of pages you have in the trial record for this appeal. And there are over a hundred of them in one of the articles about which Mr. Crooks complains. And I, for that reason, don't understand the appellant's submission to Justice Rothstein this morning that there is no issue here about indeterminate liability, because if the plaintiff says this court should assume you click on the first link, which takes you to an article called Friends of Crooks at pages 70 to 73 of the appeal book, you get there, there's over a hundred more hyperlinks. In my view, hyperlink, it would belie common sense to suggest that people simply click on every hyperlink they come across. But isn't the person who hyperlinks makes, at least makes available the material? Because there's so much, so many material, so much material on the internet that unless someone directs the attention to it, it cannot be made available, it can be said to be made available. But this morning, this morning we mostly discussed of the absence of evidence of uh, someone reading the words but you're addressing the other part, like the uh, making available, the, the, the fact that the person would not have even made available the words. That's right. But the, by the very uh, mechanism of the hyperlink, isn't the person making the information available? In my submission, no. Why? First of all, there's a major issue about whether the person's going to click on the link to begin with. Even if they do, will they even see the content when they get to the other end? It's someone else's speech. It may have changed. It may be there no longer. It may be a thousand pages down. But in that's a the second. That's the second part. Technology should transform someone into a publisher, which is the basic position that's being put forward in this court, you have to consider all aspects of the technology. You have to realize that the link may never be used, but even if it's used, the material may not be there. Inter the Internet content is essentially fluid. So even if someone looked at every page before they put up the hyperlink, five minutes later, the content could have changed altogether. So in my submission, any test based on technology and how technology works is simply too uncertain. Technology changes every day. New technology comes forward every day. We need a bright line test, and it shouldn't be based on what technology today does or doesn't afford you. No, but the, the appellant's argument is that uh, your client is using technology to inflict damage. So you can't flip it around and say, oh, well, you can't blame technology. People on the Internet use hyperlinks to point to other speech that might be of interest to the reader. This is a much better and faster and more efficient way of doing something that's been done for time immemorial. The only real complaint is that the technology makes it easier. In my submission, the technology may make it easier, but it brings a lot of other issues to the forefront which should be taken into account. It is not as simple as, now that it's easy, I should be the publisher of it even though I didn't utter the words. Certainty is very important, and I'd like to just move to my second point before I run out of time, because uh, not just the plaintiff, but the, the, the defendant in this case and the dissenting opinion of the British Columbia Court of Appeal has suggested there should be some exception based on context. 
And uh, Madam Justice Prowse started a list of the factors that the court could take into account to ascertain whether there was endorsement, approbation, and so forth. And that list was uh, found in her reasons, I believe, that paragraph 60. And, and she, she finishes her list with the observation that, you know, that was just the, just the beginning of the factors that would, the court would have to take into account. And I urge this court not to adopt a test that's based on a consideration of all of the circumstances. Again, it is simply too uncertain for the ordinary people to know in advance whether they're a publisher or not. And I'm going to give one example, and then I will conclude if I'm uh, permitted to proceed with one example, Chief Justice. This is the examples. Say, for example, someone says, this morning I attended a speech last night. It was brilliant. I unreservedly adopt every word as true. Click here to read the speech. Well, you have knowing the person was there. They know it was said. You have an endorsement, you have a recommendation, and you have a link. So I think perhaps even on the respondent's position, uh, the respondent might say that. That should be an exception. That should be publication. But if you add the surrounding circumstances to it, that the speaker, the person who saw the speech, is Rick Mercer, that the website is this hour, takes 22 minutes, and that this dinner speech last night was Prime Minister Harper, all of a sudden you cannot assume that this is any kind of endorsement at all. What you're really saying is you should look at all, as, as the, my friends to my left said, all of the surrounding circumstances to determine whether you're a publisher. Now, courts can do that. Courts can look at the surrounding circumstances. Ordinary people can't do that. It's not predictable, and it will stop people from engaging in speech on the Internet. I appreciate your time is up. Can I just ask you one question? Yes. What you're doing is, it, you're, it strikes me that that reads out of the balance, the protection from harm that's on the other side of this. So what, what that essentially suggests is that there is virtually no responsibility on the part of the person who makes a reference to a hyperlink to either read or uh, take any steps to assure himself or herself that it's legitimate, right? It's, it's a content-neutral responsibility, which well, is different from the way we think about publication in, in the non-Internet world, isn't it? In my respectful submission, no. I mean, in the non-internet world, we say, what did you say, and you're responsible for what you say. The premise of this case is that nothing defamatory was said on this gentleman's website, nothing. So it's only if you somehow incorporate the text at the other end of the hyperlink that you, begun, you begin a conversation about whether there's any responsibility for defamation. And in my respectful submission, the test for publication, given the importance of freedom of expression and the importance that members of the public know what their responsibilities are, should be drawn on, I am responsible for what I say. Thank, Thank you, you Just one second, please. In your construct, <laughs> well, when you <laughs> do you say? I, I apologize, Justice When Fischer, you incorporate by reference. No. In our you submission, say. you do not incorporate words by reference. You either say them or you don't say them. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Millen. Thank you, Chief Justice. Justices, I appear for the BC Civil Liberties Association. I'd like to uh, first talk a bit about the principles that we say are at stake in this appeal. Secondly, I want to try and demonstrate how our test best fits with those principles, as well as this Court's recent defamation cases. And finally, I'm going to refer to some U.S. case law, which essentially adopts a very similar test in the context of a hyperlink to a website that contains copyright infringing material. On the principles, the law promises all of us certain freedoms, including the freedom to express ourselves and the freedom to experience others' expression. The law also prohibits certain activity, typically because it's harmful. Defamation law prohibits us from harming others' reputation, and so freedom to speak, uh, freedom to speak goes to the point where it begins to harm others. And similarly, defamation law only goes so far as to pre uh, prevent and prohibit harm. The two principles balance each other and set boundaries for each other. Because free speech is constitutionally protected, 
the courts have always set a high bar on laws that restrict it, whether those are common law or statute. And hence, in the condensed book of authorities that we put together, uh, we've got the Edmonton Journal case. Justice Corey says that uh, the rights enshrined in Section 2B should therefore only be restricted in the clearest of circumstances. And likewise, in the Sharp case, in the second tab of our condensed book, uh, Chief Justice McLaughlin uh, held that uh, the, the focus in child pornography law must be on prevention of harm and uh, prohibitions on expression are permissible uh, only, uh, but, but any attempt to uh, restrict the right to express oneself must be subjected to the most careful scrutiny. The theme that connects these and the Court's other cases on matters of expression is a careful analysis of the harm which the law seeks to avoid and the means used by the law to avoid that harm. The law may only prohibit expression which is presumed uh, proven to be harmful. Short of that threshold, if proof of harm is lacking or if the harm is indirect, then the constitutional protection of free speech dictates that the balance favor freedom. In this respect, we submit that the limits of defamation law must be defined and justified in a manner similar to the justification of a statute under the Oaks test. Defamation law must impose a minimal impairment on free speech. When considering the application of these principles to the law of defamation in the context of hyperlinks, it's our submission that the court must take into account the fact that hyperlinks are themselves constitutionally protected expression, which all parties have agreed, and secondly, not inherently harmful in the sense that the, the hyperlink itself is, as we've discussed, content neutral. It's only what's on the end of the hyperlink that counts. We also say that what's on the beginning of the hyperlink also counts in the sense that how the hyperlink is used, how it's treated by the website author, the defendant in this case. The harm of which the plaintiff in this case complains only occurs when a reader clicks on the hyperlink and reads defamatory material on the linked site. It's for these reasons, along with the fact that virtually everyone in Canada is connected to the Internet in one way or another, that the BC Civil Liberties Association seeks to establish a bright line test for determining when hyperlinks can constitute defamation. Ordinary Canadians need an understandable, workable test in this area of the law, like the principle that truth is a defense to a charge of defamation. Not everyone can afford to consult a lawyer when they email a link to a friend or post a link on a website. Our proposed test is that liability will only follow where a website creator knowingly and explicitly adopts libelous statements on a hyperlinked site. This is consistent with the purpose of defamation law. In the absence of explicit adoption, the plaintiff's reputation is not diminished by the existence of the link. And we develop that test at some length in our factum. I should make clear that our test does not address the presumption or inference of publication. The plaintiff under our test would still have to prove that someone actually read the hyperlinked wor wor words. Our test only addresses the first part of the bilateral equation. In other words, you would apply the same kind of rule as the repetition rule. Indeed. Um, that was... So if, it's equate, if, it's, if the hyperlink can be equated to having repeated the words. In our submission, the hyperlink can be equated to having repeated the words if the person uh, creating the initial website adopts specific defamatory words on the other website and says, those are my words, I take them as my own, I take full responsibility for them. Now, I appreciate that that's going further than any right-minded person would do, but at some point, this court has to draw a line. At some point, somebody is going to be, and I'm going to, I'll take you to the U.S. cases where this is shown to be the case, people will abuse hyperlinks to achieve the same purpose of diminishing someone's reputation as if they posted the very words. But so the court has to draw a line. Is it just publication of the very words, or is there some, something short of that that still achieves the same, uh, same liability? Is it someone who creates the hyperlink in effect, indirectly uh, invites someone who, to go to it unless there are words and maybe the context will be, is important, but someone who creates the hyperlink indirectly invites someone in with the highlight that's normally attached to hyperlink, I, 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 
draws the attention to other material concerning the same thing. Drawing attention isn't sufficient. You've got to do a lot more than that to achieve publication of it and adoption of it. But it makes it available. Also. Making it, but making available words is not sufficient. Um, um, it's, it's just the fact that they're take the reportage defense under grant. The, the reportage defense uh, says that a, a journalist can repeat words, and as long as they don't adopt them, they can be uh, found not liable for those words. But we're not into the defense we're, if we're not into I understand the, that, but I think the principle is the same. Adoption is a critical component of it. Well, un under your test, you say it's got to be knowingly and explicitly. Well, what if the uh, hyperlinker uh, says, uh, uh, I, I adopt much of what's on this site? Is that, that good enough? or No. Does that let them off the hook or what? Uh, I mean, it's going to come down to a, a question of judgment to a certain extent, but in our submission it has to be uh, an explicit adoption of the defamatory words. And so we've talked about websites where you can have a – the Government of Canada website has thousands, probably millions of pages that not any single person will ever know what's on them. It has to be referenced to specific defamatory content. And the adoption has to be explicit. They have to be taking responsibility for those words. Is the repetition rule connected with adoption? No, the repetition rule – simply says that you, if, if you repeat, you're liable. If you make the words available, there's a very thin line. Don't need to adopt it. it making available is not, is not sufficient to encapsulate liability. Is it helpful to your position to substitute for adoption, incorporate by reference? Because one can, without adopting, incorporate by reference. For example, uh, the person who sets up the hyperlink says, here's some really interesting stuff, knowing it to be defamatory. Click on this hyperlink and you'll get to it. I don't agree with what's there, but it's part of the message being sent along in a sense, isn't it? Uh, in my submission, Maybe not. Uh, referential incorporation doesn't get you uh, to the point of liability, because otherwise virtually any hyperlink could be said to referentially incorporate material uh, that's on the link site. Uh, for some purpose, the creator of the hyperlink has inserted the hyperlink into their, their website, but um, they have to do more. There has to be something substantially greater than that. I mean, referential incorporation in a statute, that sort of manner, of course, obviously. You know, a definition in one statute that says, uh, as this term is defined in another. Obviously, that's uh, uh, a wholesale connection um, that, that makes one uh, effectively part of the other. And so for that purpose, I agree. But the example that you gave uh, in my submission uh, would not constitute adoption for our purposes. Uh, given the, the, the time, I'm going to request uh, simply to refer to the last article in my condensed book. Um, it's an article about uh, copyright infringement in the U.S. Uh, in the particular case that I uh, commend to you is the Corley case from the U.S. District Court. Uh, the, the essence of the case is uh, one party has a hyperlink on their site to another site. Uh, the other site has copyright infringing material. The first site says, I encourage you to mirror these files. We all have to do this. We have to get it out as much as possible. They're obviously encouraging the infringement of copyright. The court held that this was uh, uh, well, granted a permanent injunction against the first person who was doing that, and in doing so, the district court looked at defamation law and established a test that's virtually identical to the test that we've uh, uh, proposed in our factum. So I would commend that case to you. Isn't there legislation in the United States? The it comes digital, out of the Digital Millennium, digital Millennium Copyright, Act. Copyright Act, which deals exactly with what the duties and non-duties are. Of it, it, doesn't, it didn't deal with the point that the court dealt with. Okay. The court dealt with it as a matter of uh, common law and and came up with the test based on New York Times and Sullivan. So I appreciate that there are statutory and, and common law differences, but in my submission, the reasoning is, is very helpful. Thank you, Mr. Millen. Mr. Anderson. Chief Justice, Justices. Um, we represent seven umbrella uh, organizations who in turn represent a significant 
a percentage of the Canadian print, broadcast, freelance journalist, and publishing uh, industries in Canada. Uh, each of the industries is coming of age in this uh, internet digital uh, world that we now live in. As many of the affiants, both uh, filed by Net Coalition and by uh, my clients, have uh, stated in their evidence, uh, hyperlinking is a fundamental importance, um, indeed uh, may be the very heart of uh, the internet. As the affiants uh, of the materials filed by my clients have stated, um, in this digital world first, as Ms. Graham calls it, uh, hyperlinking has become uh, critical uh, to the ability of uh, those industries to both uh, bring content uh, to their readership in a competitive environment which now competes internationally and indeed uh, effectively to uh, retain economic survival. Uh, the materials uh, support the proposition that uh, in the event uh, that the, the for Vancouver Sun is an example uh, a half of their a digital world first reality now comes through Google and hyperlinks are an enormously important part of whether you do or do not rank in Google. Um, one of the uh, authors, Mr. Jarvis, has said uh, a, a hyperlink less site is of no economic value. Um, the proposition that the uh, affiants uh, support um, is to the effect that if hyperlinking is publication, it will have a serious impact on uh, the, con the ability of those industries to bring content to its readership and to maintain its economic survival. Uh, Ms. Graham and others share uh, Justice Sharon's concern about having a chicken perspective. Um, and absent the ability to hyperlink in the digital age, the affiants all support the proposition that they simply won't be able to compete, particularly with their American colleagues to the south. Um, and given the way hyperlinks are used in those industries, it's simply not possible uh, for the organizations to investigate at the time the links are made on the kind of way you would of your own articles, or uh, to continue to monitor the changing sites as would be necessary. I thought there was no, I mean, in, in, in the terms of the competition and your public policy concern, I thought there, most of the legislation in the United States doesn't require monitoring. It, the issue of liability only arises when to their attention. Does Indeed, it only comes to their attention if they're an ISP, then the uh, question of um, uh, innocent dissemination arises. Uh, a hyperlink is simply not publication in the United States, so the issue of publication doesn't come to play. If, for example, the Vancouver Sun blog, and we, they have blogs of their columnists, and they're interactive blogs, if there is a, uh, somebody who posts something on one of those blogs, and if that were in the United States and it was brought to their attention, they're the publisher, if you will. It's on their site. They have the ability to remove the content site, which, of course, as Mr. Cerf says, is the only thing that really matters if you want to stop harm. And so that's when innocent dissemination comes to play. As Ms. Matheson said, they are publishers. Uh, in the United States, a hyperlink does not constitute publication. Now, isn't, isn't this uh, preventing or saying that the courts should not take into consideration the harm that's potentially done by hyperlinks? Well, one person's harm is another person's joy. Uh, hyperlinking is the Internet. Yes, but uh, you're asking us even to say that there, hyperlinks have absolutely no effect, when in practice, this is not the reality. Well, so is, shouldn't we try to have some kind of approach that, that, that is more balanced than that? 
Well, I wanted to start from the proposition of what hyperlinks mean to the media and what the impact will be, uh, what happens. Now I'd like to go, uh, in my short time if I might, to um, why hyperlinking just is not publication and uh, why um, uh, we should treat um, a hyperlinked site uh, as if it's an article in the New York Times or in the uh, Vancouver Sun and we apply our regular common law rules of republication or legal innuendo or the like. Um, the, um, leaving aside the technological description of a hyperlink, functionally, it is simply a fast and efficient way to get readers to other materials on the Internet. People have called it a map, a footnote, an index card, a neutral technology, Justice Binney, Justice LaBelle today. Um, now, I'd like to draw your attention to the footnote analogy for a moment. Um, the appellant does not embrace that analogy. But whether or not a hyperlink uh, does or doesn't resemble a footnote is an interesting debate. But in the exploding e-publishing industry that we're in today, a footnote is indeed a hyperlink. The e-publishing industry has effectively turned all footnotes into hyperlinks. But it normally, so far, hyperlinks to the name of the publication. If it's a book, the book will most of the time not be on the Internet. It depends on the nature, as this Court has said before, the nature, and I think Justice Abella, the nature of the, the, the footnote. One might say, as one author, said, one of the affiants said, it's a footnote to Mein Kampf. Another might say, for an interesting analysis of why Mr. Smith is a bad guy, uh, see this, or various other things. Whatever the reality is, I respectfully submit if the appellant is correct, the publishing industry is in the same position as the media in its e-publishing world. It is not that articles, uh, the media and the publishing industry, footnotes and articles, are going to have the same fast and efficient way of getting from one to the other. I ask you to help me figure this out then. If, if it's, we accept the obvious, that it's easy access to information by a hyperlink, if there were a New York Times article which said, continued on page 32, the, the content, but when it came to the web version of that article, they just hyperlinked uh, page 32, which had reference to a previous New York Times Indeed. article. Indeed. So you're saying that on the heart, the newspaper would be liable for the published form of the newspaper, but not when it converted virtually the same information into something more easily accessible through a hyperlink? No, no, I, I, I'm not. I, I'm saying that, uh, first of all, the New York Times articles would not be vetted by any media outlet in Canada. Um, one of the purposes of hyperlinking is Mr. Uh, Professor Hermedia says, is to increase content and to do what you do best, which is local content, and link to the rest. And so if you want to compete in, as a Vancouver Sun and you want to include articles of Professor Obama, uh, President Obama, you don't write them yourself, you link to them. Now the reality is, they don't vet those stories, and they can't, don't have the wherewithal to vet those stories. But if they publish them, if they, uh, this goes to the concept of repetition. If they publish them, forget the New York Times, it, uh, Globe and Mail published something that was alleged to be discriminatory in its print section, but when it did it online, it used a hyperlink form. Are no, if it's the publisher, as, as the Canadian Civil Liberties Association said in their factum, with which I agree, uh, if you hyperlink to something that you wrote, 
you're, 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 you're publishing and, and republishing. I, I mean, my, my, my. It's not just hyper, because you, you, you started with a pretty broad proposition. Hyperlinks are not publication, but they may be. They're not per se. I, I, and, and, and if I might leave with the Chief Justice's uh, comment early in the day that the common law of defamation and repetition, publication, uh, legal innuendo are more than capable of addressing hyperlinks and their impact. And if you make an exception of hyperlinks because of the nature of the technology, you do tremendous harm uh, to uh, the media and, and to, uh, and I haven't addressed Twitter and Twitter and, and such like, which are effectively um, a hyperlink world. Well, I'm not sure I said all that, but uh, thank you. <laughs> I added Twitter and Twitter to Chief Justice. Thank you. I, knew, I know that you were an expert in the area. <laughs> uh, Mr. Dearden. Good afternoon, Justices. Uh, I will uh, be addressing on behalf of the Canadian Internet Policy and Public Interest Clinic uh, uh, what the evidentiary standard um, that a libel plaintiff must fulfill to prove that a hyperlinker is the publisher of defamatory statements found in the linked site. And uh, CPIC submits that that evidentiary standard should be one similar to that that you used in Dagenet and Mentuck for non-publication orders, that of a convincing evidentiary foundation. And that will get me into dealing with the issue of whether you can have a presumption of publication and the issue of reasonable inference of publication. The, uh, so the template that I'm uh, submitting the court should consider is that of a convincing evidentiary foundation, which was the requirement that was imposed when the court decided what does a trier of fact have to decide in issuing a non-publication order. So the R versus Mantuck case of paragraph 39 said that has to be a convincing evidentiary basis. And the Dagenet case, Justice McLaughlin, uh, you had warned at page 950 of the Dagenet case that we have to guard against facile assumptions and we have to guard against speculation when the trial judge is deciding whether to issue a non-publication order. So CPIC submits that the question the trier of fact needs to decide on whether a hyperlinker has published the defamatory statements in the linked site is a convincing evidentiary, it has to be based on a convincing evidentiary foundation that those statements in the linked site were communicated to at least one person other than the plaintiff. So that, in my respectful submission, leaves no room for a presumption of publication. The common law has never made a presumption of publication. It's always required the plaintiff to prove that the defamatory statements were published to a third person. And I submit post-charter there should be no presumption of publication that the plaintiffs today have enough uh, benefit of presumptions, which is falsity and damages being presumed. And the backdrop to that, of course, is that, remember, we're, we're dealing with linked websites that could contain hundreds of pages. And to presume a reader of the primary site, one, linked into that site, or, or did the link to the, to the site that's hyperlinked, searched and found the page that contains the defamatory statements, and then read the defamatory statements, in my respectful submission, is an unreasonable presumption, so there should be no presumption of publication um, in, in play with respect to the, the hyperlink uh, materials that contain the defamatory statements. Now, what about the reasonable inference? Uh, the issue before the court is not whether a reasonable inference can be drawn that a third person read defamatory statements in the primary article. That was the Gaskin case. That's what you're dealing with with those credit reports in the Gaskin case where 
Gatley was relied upon by the court um, to allow for a reasonable inference that people read the primary article. The issue in this appeal is whether a reasonable inference can be, dra- can be drawn that a reader of the primary article in turn linked into the, the site that contains the defamatory statement, searched and found the defamatory statements and read them. And my submission and what I invite the court to do is say the trier of fact in that situation shouldn't be asking the question, can a reasonable inference be drawn that the hyperlinker published the defamatory statements in the link site? The question should be, based on the evidence that's been put before me as a trier of fact, whether it's the judge or the jury, do I have a clear and convincing evidentiary foundation that there was publication? It's, it, it allows for reasonable inference, that test, that standard. There could be cases where the judge concludes or the jury concludes that there is a convincing evidentiary foundation, which, get, which if you use the reasonable inference approach, would come to the same conclusion. But I say with the speech that's involved here, the online communication that we're talking about, the impact on hyperlinking that we're dealing with here, there's a danger of using reasonable inference. And that would be illustrated by what Justice Prouse um, found uh, in, her, in her dissent. And I have uh, paragraph 71 of the dissent at tab 3 of the condensed book. At tab 3 of, of, of uh, CFIC's condensed book, Justice Prouse really summarizes uh, why she found there was a reasonable inference that there was publication, and that is, one, that uh, the number of views, which was 1,788 of the original site, two, the fact that the article deals with free free speech and defamation, and three, the reference to lawsuits involving crooks, would have served as words of encouragement or invitation to a person viewing Mr. Newton's article to look further and she did not consider it a mere bibliographical, uh, a bibliographical footnote. From a practical point of view, then, is that an invitation to get expert evidence on what readers of articles normally do or don't do about hyperlinks, or do you go to the specific article and evidence about what the 1788 hits represent in terms of what they actually link to? The latter. The latter. I would not be advocating experts in libel actions. There's complicated enough, Justice Abella. I'm not advocating that at all. But what I'm saying this is that you see at paragraph 71 is speculation. It is a guess that one of those 1,788 views, of which a number are robots, okay, that one of those 1,788 views on the primary site was a reader who linked onto that site, searched and found the defamatory statements, and read the defamatory statements. Is it technically possible to determine whether somebody who has read an article has gone to the link and whether that reader of the link is a robot or, or a real person? My understanding is yes. You can. Thank you. Yes. So the concern I have, and this is why I'm illustrating the danger of, using, of, of taking the reasonable inference approach as opposed to a clear and convincing evidentiary foundation approach is, is, is this. That is still a guess that you see at paragraph 71. And if you use the template of Dajane Mentuk as to what is required, what's the requirement of evidence to, uh, to, to make a finding uh, for a non-publication order, or in this case, whether there's been publication of the defamatory statements in the link site, you won't have these speculative possibilities or guesses that are going to lead uh, to a finding of, um, of, of publication. And could I just finish, uh, um, Justices, by dealing with a point that was raised earlier today about this ease of access or the method of access that uh, hyperlinks give you to additional sources of information that are identified by the hyperlink. So a hyperlink is one click, right? And say once you click on it, it takes 1.5 seconds. I haven't timed it myself, but say it's that. But then let's take the example of a print publication where 
The website, the print publication like the Globe or the Ottawa Citizen provides a website address. So if I'm a quick typer, I plug in that website address, say it takes me five seconds to get to that exact site that the hyperlink took me to in 1.5 seconds. What's the difference? Seconds, just seconds. And I submit that, that the ease of access or the technology that's now available today and who knows what it's going to be, you know, two years from now, should not be used to punish and find liability uh, for people that use hyperlinks in online communications. And in the Carter case, which is an, another BC Court of Appeal decision, they found you're not publishing defamatory statements that may be found in that website that you gave the address for. And that makes a lot of sense. And I'm submitting that just because you can hyperlink and it gives you uh, a real accelerated access to uh, the, the linked material that shouldn't be used against you to impose liability. And those are my submissions, Chief Justice. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McDowell. Chief Justice, Justices. <clears throat> And that coalition for whom I appear is interested in this case because it seeks to protect organizers of content on the web. In overview, various entities seek through automatic means to create an index to everything which appears on the Internet. This indexing creates the interconnectivity, which is the essence of the World Wide Web, which has allowed a great expansion in the world of ideas. We say fundamentally that the court's focus must be on the offending object and not on the index. We say that inclusion of a, of a hyperlink to a libel by a blogger, which is what I'll use as the example, should not be treated as publication of the libel itself unless either, one, the blogger and the website creator act towards a common end, or two, the blogger explicitly endorses the content of the link material in a way that is actionable in itself. We're concerned as well about the problem of indeterminacy. If Mr. Newton is presumed to be liable for having published and linked to a defamatory site, then someone posting a link to Mr. Newton's website is also liable. This creates world without end. To impose liability for mere linking is to create indeterminate liability. Now, Just to be the devil's advocate, on the other hand, the pe your, your people on the other side say that it creates infinite possibility for damage to reputation. Immediately almost immediately, um, and uh, that therefore uh, this would justify um, a corresponding alteration uh, to... Well, we're not living in the Gaskin world, the, the days of the post office and the good old days, that the, the technology has created the ability for information to go out instantly, as we're seeing in recent current events. But that doesn't mean that we should uh, construct something that almost immediately creates a chill on this sort of interconnectivity and creates a suppression or a, um, yeah, but a deflation, the, if you will, in the, in the world of ideas. The volume of information is such that unless someone directs the attention to the information, it's useless. But the so problem we is, have to give some weight to this action. But the problem, Justice Teixeira, is that it's not just people per se who are creating hyperlinks. Hyperlinks are being created automatically by browsers. And so that part of the relief that uh, the appellant sought at the outset was an order, I gather, that the link be removed. But that would be futile in itself because automatically other links are being created on a constant basis. So let me just touch on some of the facts that were filed by Mr. Cerf, who was one of the foundational thinkers about the uh, Internet. Um, he points out that an author may create a page containing hyperlinks, as Justice Prouse found, but that the links automatically appear in text having been created by search engines. He also deals with the question of the automated dialogue between uh, hyperlinks and browsers. Cerf uses the analogy of the card catalog, so that he says that the, the hyperlinks are individual cards in this giant index which has been created. There are limits uh, to the analogy. In, in that the court has observed today that the book at the destination in the card catalog at a library is static. The destinations for the hyperlinks in our uh, 
cyber world are not static. An author may put a hyperlink on a web page, the content, the destination may change constantly without notice to the blogger. So if you take the example that Surf offers of the New York Times front page, it's a static hyperlink, but the content is changing on a rolling basis. Now, as to the question of publication itself, as Justice Binney suggested in one of his questions, publication is bilateral, and that comes from the Gutnick case in Australia itself at paragraph 24. There is no harm until somebody reads it. So when a blogger posts a hyperlink, there can be no suggestion of publication until a reader clicks on the link. Now, for Net Coalition, the issue is not the metrics of the situation. If there are three million people, uh, or sorry, if there are three million clicks on the link, it's difficult to presume or to think that nobody actually read it. But the question is whether, as a matter of principle, the uh, blogger who has a hyperlink on his page who published it. As Cerf says in the condensed book, the mirror is not the object, as a matter of principle. The map is not the territory as it describes. Or it describes. At, a pol at the level of policy, we offer the example of the bookseller in the Smith versus California case in the condensed book at tab four. There, the court rejected the notion that a bookseller should be held liable for the obscene contents found scattered in different places in the bookshop. The court observed that if the material in the shop could be imputed to the bookseller, the bookseller would simply self-censor. If you're a bookseller and you've got a strict liability ordinance, you'll be very, very careful to the extreme in what you carry in the shop. This, said the court, creates a public harm. And so it is here we say uh, the defamer, if in fact the destination site is defamatory, has created and posted the libel. All the hyperlink does functionally is create an index entry for the libel. Now, as to the question of common cause, ordinarily uh, there is no common cause between the blogger and the creator of the libel. And there's always a concern about the notion that you could have a server or a web page which was outside the jurisdiction of the court, which is engaged in something damaging. Well, we offer in the condensed book at paragraph 7 an excerpt from Collins' uh, text on Internet defamation. And he describes there the case of Douglas and Hello, that in breach of confidence cases, liability as a joint tortfeasor will only be imposed where the claimant proves concerted action to a common end. And so that is a carve-out, if you will, from the, the general rule which we say should obtain that, that the blogger is not to be treated as having published, so that liability might be imposed where the plaintiff can prove some kind of concerted action. That goes back to my question about the, uh, the Zundel site. There's no concerted action. Somebody is simply achieving a purpose of damaging uh, an individual by collecting all the, the junk out there in the Internet and then creating hyperlinks and saying, well, I'm not saying it, they're saying it. Right, but if you, if you look at it as a kind of civil conspiracy, in that instance, you could find the defendant in the, in the jurisdiction, plead conspiracy, which you'd have to do with particularity. But there is no conspiracy at all. It may be totally unrelated. It's just the initiative of the individual creating this uh, content that's using hyperlinks to evade, really, responsibility. If that's the purpose, then there's a common design, really, between the blogger and the object of the of the collected sites. So in the Zundel case is a perfect example that no one imagined as the facts unfolded that Zundel was unconnected in sentiment or in relationships with these uh, external websites. So there, there's a way of dealing with that <coughs> that won't deal with all of the defendants, but it will deal with the one within the jurisdiction of the court. In the excerpt you referred to, uh, Mr. Collins, make a, makes a difference between procuring the commission of uh, the tort and facilitating it by analogy, what would amount to procuring, <laughs> uh, would inviting, actively inviting uh, someone to go to the link? Uh, Where it could be demonstrated that there was some collateral purpose for which there was going to be publication, so that the, the creator of the link has some interest in damaging uh, the plaintiff. 
the mens rea test? On, on the road to a mens rea test, I would say. But you couldn't just, you couldn't just plead it as a matter of, of course. You'd have to have some, you'd have to be able to posit some reason that the blogger intended to damage, uh, intended to damage the plaintiff. Here, if you take the facts in this case, there seems to be no such suggestion anywhere in the record. Now, the question of endorsement. Um, we are not so pessimistic, perhaps, of the ability of the courts to administer uh, a test like this, that there may, in fact, be rare instances where the blogger endorses the libel and where the blogger would then be subject to the ordinary operation of the established law relating to innuendo. Uh, a statement that is innocent on its face may have a defamatory meaning when it is communicated to a person with knowledge of extrinsic facts. This is the old case of Lewis in the Daily Te Telegraph. Um, this is a separate publication, so it really only tangentially involves the link. So where a blogger says, we know all about Jones's morality, that is benign on its face, if there's a link to a site which describes Jones's immorality, then his endorsement is by itself publication of a libel by innuendo. And we say that that is the law that should be applicable in these circumstances. I see my time is up. I won't address innocent dissemination. Thank, Thank you very much. I think that brings us to uh, the reply. Thank you, Chief Justice. I'm going to uh, reply firstly to the submissions of uh, the respondent. Uh, during uh, so toing and froing with the bench, and, uh, an example was given where it was asserted that if you hand a written article to someone, then you are publishing it. And respectfully, that's exactly what including a hyperlink in a piece of text is. It's the equivalent, the modern day equivalent, of handing the article to someone. And that fits and dovetails very, very nicely with Gaskin saying that in certain circumstances a prima facie case arises. I asked for a report, you sent it to me, it's been published. And you note in Gaskin there's no separate requirement that you have to prove that it's been read. The bilaterality of the exchange is itself enough. And in a similar way, the, uh, uh, the Australian jurisprudence in, in the uh, case of Dow Jones and Gunken used uh, a language which says publication is a bilateral act. It is an act in which a publisher makes available and a third party has it available for their comprehension. So publication there can be a presumption of publication in circumstances where, because of the special nature, the asking for a report and the report being made available, a prima facie case does arise. And respectfully, in circumstances where the hyperlink is part of the text, it is not, and I've heard these words, a mere hyperlink or a pure hyperlink. And a reasonable reader wouldn't understand it as being something not worthy of credit. A reasonable reader, when it appears in the text, in my respectful submission, would say this is something, to use a term which uh, uh, has been used much here, this is an endorsement. Respectfully, I don't think that the law can uh, uh, pivot on whether or not the author of the text used specific words of, en <clears throat> of endorsement, because that would be simply providing a mechanism to avoid liability by couching your words carefully. There was a discussion with counsel for the respondents related to whether an inference should be drawn on the number of hits. Now, the inference which was drawn by the dissenting judge in the court below was not just premised upon the number of hits. It was premised upon the number of hits coupled with the fact that the article dealt with free speech and defamation and referenced and also included references to the lawsuits involving uh, Mr. Crooks. And those coupled together were found to be an encouragement. And the judge relied upon, the dissenting judge relied upon, the inherent unlikelihood that with that number of hits, nobody read the article. 
And I say that whether or not there is other evidence which might be available, more evidence which might be available, doesn't mean that there's not sufficient evidence to support an inference. So the fact that there might be more evidence that may be garnered further down the line does not mean that there's not sufficient evidence in the case at bar to support an inference. I want to then just move uh, uh, from there because it, it segues nicely into that point to the position taken by the Internet Clinic, who argues that uh, the test should be different, that it should be clear and convincing. There must be clear and convincing evidence. And that's as opposed to the normal civil test of uh, being entitled to make a reasonable inference on the balance of probabilities. And respectfully, to adopt that test seems to me to be inconsistent with this Court's fairly recent judgment in FH versus McDougall, McDougal which uh, uh, appeared respectfully to be a, a, an attempt to put an end to uh, analyses which are based upon other elucidations of what uh, the standard of proof would be. The respondents uh, made reference to uh, two cases from the UK which they say deal with the uh, notion that publication uh, does not arise from a hyperlink. The first of those cases, which is at tab one of their authorities, is the Jamil case. And in the Jamil case, the presumption that the plaintiff sought was a presumption of substantial publication. And that was denied based upon the facts of that case. And, and that has to do with a number of elements of, of the law in Great Britain which are not uh, part of our law. But that was the presumption which was denied, the presumption of substantial publication, not a presumption of publication. Neither respectfully was their language saying presumptions don't exist. With regard to the other case they relied upon at tab 19 of their brief of authorities, the Metropolitan uh, International case, this was a case in which the uh, uh, courts in Great Britain uh, did something which we have been at a caution not to do here. Uh, they mixed uh, the notion of publication with the attempt to uh, um, what would be the equivalent of the uh, giving notice, because in that case, Publication was held not to have occurred, and this is in paragraph 64 of that judgment, given the steps taken by the defendant to block the identified URLs, I, and that's the, the reference points, I believe it was unrealistic to attribute publication in those circumstances. So that's a mixture of uh, other elements, which are further down the evidentiary chain, uh, with the doctrine of publication, uh, and that's, uh, uh, I say, an example of the notion of publication being reformatted and reconsidered based upon uh, the fact that it was uh, uh, an Internet uh, publication. Turning then uh, to the interveners, uh, respectfully, uh, with regard to the position taken by the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, the, uh, the position really comes down to this. Hyperlinks are not publication. And uh, as this court has said in other contexts, I grant you, at a certain point, a particular level of formalism like, like that ought to come from the legislature. A broad-based rule like that, which is the rule in the United States of America, that hyperlinks are not publication ought to be an act of Parliament uh, in that, those circumstances. And if that, but if that, and if that becomes the rule, then uh, you can harm all you like using uh, hyperlinks. But that's not currently the law in Canada. The uh, BC Civil Liberties, Liberties Association couches their position in terms of a knowing and explicit adoption of the particular defamatory portion of an article. Again, uh, that allows uh, uh, the author of the hyperlink to carefully couch their uh, uh, reference to the def uh, potentially defamatory material and uh, potentially avoid uh, liability that way, but yet still cause the harm, still potentially cause very significant harm can be avoided by simply couching your language uh, uh, 
uh, carefully. And the uh, BC Civil Liberties Association also says that regard should be, have, be had and some part uh, of the test for publication might reasonably reflect the comments that this court has made about reportage. But of course, reportage has a number of elements uh, and uh, uh, if, all of, if some of them are going to be adopt, adopted, then serious uh, uh, consideration should be given to other elements of that defense, and it is a defense, such as uh, the report indicates that the truth has not been verified, and it sets out both sides of the dispute fairly. The uh, media interveners, uh, responding to the media interveners' position, in my respectful submission, there is no uh, considered basis for supporting a right in the media interveners to act less responsibly, less responsibly in this new media than in their other guises, whether they be newspapers or televisions uh, or e-publishing. These are people who are used to uh, uh, doing some due diligence and, and acting responsibly and acting fairly, and there's no reason in my respectful submission to relieve them of that obligation in the context of the Internet. Uh, finally, I turn to the uh, NET Coalition. And uh, again, they have uh, uh, couched a, a large part of their argument uh, along the basis of it has to be a knowing endorsement. And you, you've heard me on that, but I did want to respond because it highlights a point which is very uh, important to this case. With their reference to a mirror isn't the image and a map is not the territory that it reflects. But neither the mirror nor the map, neither the mirror nor the map make any considered judgment about what they're doing. They are what they are. They don't, they're not animate, they don't make a decision, I'm going to hyperlink to this. And at the end, uh, uh, when all is said and done, respectfully, that's a crucial feature of this case that must be addressed. Thank you, that's my reply. Thank you. Thank you all. The court will reserve its decision on this appeal. And the court stands adjourned. <laughs>